three. Are we live? All right, everyone. Welcome to the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. My name is Sarah Justice. I'm the executive director here at the Paris Gibson Square. I am super thrilled to have each and every one of you here in the audience tonight, or this afternoon. It's not night yet, is it? And also, just so everyone knows, this is live stream. So hi to everyone out there. I hope there's many, many people that are watching in in this special day. We are super thrilled to have the opening day for Peter Koch, the book as a work of art. Can I get a round of applause from the audience? Thank you. <laughs> We feel super, super blessed and fortunate to have Peter Koch's work gracing this institution. This is a very powerful exhibition. It is taking up two of our galleries. It's the Thayer Gallery and the Ross Schiller Gallery. This body of work came together because of our curator of exhibitions and collections, Nicole Maria Evans, who will be up here shortly to introduce our panelists. So between two and six today, Mountain Time, we're gonna have a lecture series with these amazing predominant uh, intellects and exciting people that are here to talk about Peter Koch's work, their um, knowledge of him, their relationship with him, so on and so forth. Each of these panelists also have their own artistic practice or whether they're a conservator or a curator of rare books. But they're here with us today all the way from New York City, San Francisco, and Berkeley, California. So we're super, super happy to have you here with us today. Thank you for taking the time to learn about this exhibition, to care about this exhibition, and to support the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. Without further ado, I wanna introduce you to our amazing curator, Nicole Maria Evans, who has done an outstanding job researching putting this exhibition together, preparing the galleries. It's been a ton of work and she's just done an excellent job. Thank you, Nicole. Come on up. Thank you. Great. One second. A little mic change. This mic thing is a little tricky. Well, Sarah did an excellent job introducing everybody briefly. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for attending the lecture series. And I do also want to thank all of our sponsors, including special sponsors such as Printing Center USA, who made our lovely booklet possible with that large donation and for supporting the exhibit itself, as well as Montana Woman Magazine, who um, supports the institution as well, and Megan Crawford, who is the designer of the catalog. She is also the owner of Montana Woman USA, including all our state and governmental sponsors, such as Humanities Montana, Montana Arts and Culture, and as well as um, Humanities for the Arts and National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, and many, many other individuals who support us. The book basing workshop tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> um, just a quick sideways um, discussion quickly. Our wonderful education director, Eliza Weber, will be leading a community bookshop uh, a community workshop for bookmaking tomorrow, which is also open to the public and um, will be a wonderful ex experience. Honestly, I can't talk with this. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. It's just. Yeah. Excuse the interruption with that. Yeah. Okay. It's just echoing and I can't hear what I'm saying. Okay. It's confusing me. Okay. Yeah. So I apologize for that. We're trying to test the sound in here and it's, it's acting strange. Yes. 
I am soft-spoken, so I feel like I'm yelling, but I'll be trying to speak a little bit louder for all of you. I feel a lot better right now, so thank you so much. <laughs> and what I'm trying to say is please attend the bookshop that Eliza, we the workshop that Eliza Weber has put together so thoughtfully for our community, for adults and for children, to engage not only with the skill of making books and paper making, and also relationship between word and, and image to coincide with Peter Koch, work, uh, the book as a work of art. So thank you so much, Eliza, for doing that for us. We are, um, you're giving us a gift to our community. Now back on track to where we were going. Thank you, Peter, for being here. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for Roberto. These are our guest lecturers who are here to support Peter Koch in this exhibition and rendition of an exhibition that um, presents an array of Peter's work since the 1970s until today. And this is one of the first exhibits in Montana that brings this array of artwork to Montana, but, Mon but Peter is not a stranger to Montana in the arts world. And he has engaged with the history of Montana and the way his work resonates is by asking us to complicate the history in which we live in and also engage an understanding in the fine art press, in bookmaking, as well as how that uh, relates to our um, experience and knowledge of history that we are taught in school. Beyond that, a further reach into the very origin of the book, the very origin of printmaking and the press, and what that means to us and our culture today in such an electronic world that we live in. So I am thankful to all of you for coming, and I will introduce the first speaker today, and as we go along, we'll introduce each speaker individually. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Aaron Parrott. Dr. Aaron Parrott is a professor of literature at the University of Providence, and he has uh, participated in collaborated project, collaborative projects with uh, Peter Koch from an early time, including writing essays in his catalog resume and working with him on a variety of different projects. And having said that, I'm going to go ahead and bring Aaron up to, to the front here. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, well, thank you very much for having me, and I'm really grateful to Paris Gibson and Nicole and Sarah for putting this on. It's great to be in Great Falls, and I have to also give a shout out to my first boss, who is responsible partly for my love of books, Jim Heckel, <laughs> library director down in Helena, <laughs> probably corrupted me when he said, yeah, you can sort all the new donations and uh, keep whatever you'd like. So uh, that started my love of books. Um, in the span of his 70 something years on planet Earth, Peter Koch has witnessed the coming of age in his home state of Montana. Slow emergence from, I would describe it as its self imposed immaturity of the Montana face. I don't know if you're familiar with that essay by Leslie Fiedler. Um, eloquently cataloged by El Leslie Fiedler. Um, two, its ascendancy as what people like to describe as the last best place. And as the descendant of one of the Montana pioneers, Peter Gillenberg, is that how you say that? Koch, uh, who helped found the university down in Bozeman, Peter inherited the inside knowledge of how Indian lands were colonized uh, and how rustic European values were laid down over the crude maps first sketched by fur trappers and gold miners. Um, how civilization's thin veneer has only recently colored this remote region of the country and is forever being eroded away by the acid iniquities of developers uh, and politicians. In the course of a half century, he's put his knowledge to good use in creating a body of work that is once at once a showcase of the book arts, the art preservative of all art, as they say. And he has uh, also a com 
made a, com a compelling philosophical commentary on his home state. And so today I want to talk about uh, Peter's place in the intellectual and artistic history of Montana, at least as I see it in my idiosyncratic way. Um, it's also worth remembering at the outset that like other intellectuals and artists before him, I think of Ovid who was exiled from Rome to the Black Sea, or James Joyce who helped give Ireland a modern identity from his exile in Paris and Trieste. Uh, Peter Koch's perspective happens to be that of the former insider looking back in from the outside. Uh, from his own self-imposed exile in Berkeley, California. And his return here today, in some sense, as a homecoming, um, and surely coming home must jog Peter's memory of his own beginnings as a printer uh, down there at the Blackstone Press on uh, 3rd Street in Missoula, where Bernice's Bakery is now, if you are um, and though he lives in California, he inhabits, and I would say is inhabited by Montana, haunted, you might even say, much in the way that another one of his uh, mentors famously said, I am haunted by water. After earning a degree in philosophy from the University of Montana in the 1970s, Koch uh, somewhat counterintuitively chose to devote his life to documenting Montana and all that it means in pursuit of an antiquated and some would say obsolete technology, uh, letterpress printing. And along the way, he's become world renowned as one of the masters of printing and the book arts. And you're all familiar with his singular books. And if not, I can't think of a better place to get acquainted than right next door. Um, they've put together an excellent exhibition uh, spanning most of his career over there. And he is a printer and an artist, but I've always thought of him since the moment I first met him as a philosopher, really, and a philosopher of Montana in the tradition of Diogenes, maybe, the guy who famously carried a lamp around to illuminate the shadowy recesses of the world around him. A philosopher whose medium has not been the writing of words so much as the printing of words, 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 words. Um, and I think he learned early on to appreciate beyond the semantic value of words, the visual appearance of text on the page arranged in a beautiful way with appropriate typeface and illustration and ornament. Um, and I think he also learned at the knees of his grandfather Ehlers, who was a, a pretty famous Montana author of The High Trail and 40 Years of Forester, and also his neighbor in Missoula, Leslie Fiedler, the great uh, Montana literary critic. Um, after traveling the world as a young man and experiencing what we might call a spiritual epiphany in Tangiers, I think I have that right, uh, he settled down to study and, and to value and revere the way books are made, the way in which letters and images can be presented beautifully on the page. And he learned under the auspices of his mentors and colleagues in the world of letterpress printing um, that he would soon dive into in the 1970s to appreciate, as Marshall McLuhan said, nobody remembers this guy, but he said, the medium is the message. <laughs> um, and that the presence of ideas and words on the page, uh, as you'll see showcased in his urtext next door, uh, I think that summarizes the moment at which he realized uh, what he needed to do. So in a sense, to engage with Peter Koch, or to examine his work is, in my mind, to do philosophy, since his books and prints beget the sort of intercourse that requires one to think, and to think in specific ways. Um, and the three traditional branches of philosophy are ontology, the study of being, metaphysics, and ethics. And I think his artifacts require a reader to think about the ontology of the book, the being of, of a book as an object, but also to reflect on the metaphysics of meaning. And then finally, to investigate the ethics of human production. And I think that's where he's at uh, most recently. So in this analogy, uh, Peter Koch is the Socrates of the book world. And we are all the youth of Athens happily accompanying him into the agora of his studio or the Codex Book Fair or this exhibition at Paris Gibson in Great Falls, Montana. And so I propose that the way to understand his contributions to the world of books and book arts is to catalog them in the Dewey Decimal System, not in the 700s with the art, it is 700s, right? Uh, but with the 100s, the philosophy. 
Um, so what he has been up to for the last half century, in my mind, is a robust philosophical investigation that uses the techniques of letterpress printing rather than the stolid and stupefying jargon of logic and academic philosophy. And like Henry Bugby, who was a professor at U of M where he went, or Leslie Fiedler, um, I think Peter Koch interrogates our concepts of being. Um, he interrogates our concept of meaning and truth. So I would call that the Montana metaphysics. And he articulates in his ink-stained way an ethics for how to approach the future. Um, and I think he is doing the work of philosophy, a peculiar kind of Montana philosophy, and you'll see Montana in all of his works. Uh, using the tools of printing as an artistic undertaking, and I think one of the results of that has been the discovery of who we are here in Montana beyond the whole place narrative stuff. Uh, perhaps a specific case, as Wittgenstein would say, of who we are as human beings. And so I want to emphasize that the ethics are especially relevant in the Montana connection uh, because of the extraction project, which explores the intersection of human art and our destructive or extractive impact on the environment. And Montana, as you know, with its ever-increasing plagues of forest fires and dwindling fisheries, happens to be one of those places where the effects are felt most keenly. So here's another way, though, I think of him as a philosopher. And if you know him, I think you'll understand this. Uh, Carl Jaspers once said that about St. Augustine that he thinks in questions. And uh, I think this is true of Peter's work also, not just the artifacts, the books he makes, but also in the form of his cocktail parties and dinners hosted by he and his wife Susan, uh, or in the form of his grand convocational projects like uh, Codex, but also in the form of every conversation he's ever had with friends and colleagues. Um, he really thinks in questions. The scope of his queries ranging from what if we do this thing, or why do you suppose it's like this? Um, and the thing about talking to Peter is it's really always having a conversation in that behind every declarative sentence he utters, there's the echo of a question, like what, what might this mean? Or where are we headed with this? Um, and in other words, the way you know someone is thinking hard about a subject, and think seriously about the world is they, in honesty, tend to punctuate their sentences with, I don't know. And if you have a conversation with Peter, you'll hear, hear him say, I don't know, a lot. I don't know, but. Um, not that he doesn't have a lot of confirmed opinions and convictions. I don't mean that he waffles on the fundamentals. I just mean that he's in constant investigation of the world around him. And Aristotle famously said that philosophy starts wherever there is thaumat. Sion, the, the sense of wonder. And more than anything, I think this principle is what I see operating behind every spectacular book he's made. He's a sincere and earnest sense of wonder. And that sense of wonder tends to lead the best scientists, mathematicians, artists, and philosophers to the most fruitful and interesting results. And perhaps more importantly, ensures that the difficult and taxing work along the way will involve a certain measure of fun. Take the Codex Book Fair as an example. Um, this is an enterprise that changed the landscape of the book arts, I think, internationally. And if you've ever been to a book arts fair, especially Codex, you know that the, participa the participants are among the most conscientious and serious artisans on the planet. They're very serious about their work. And yet, uh, the festival itself exudes this spirit of fun and goodwill. I would call it unadulterated fun. And in this, I think Peter follows the injunction of Plato, probably the, the most famous of philosophers, who in one of his letters confided to his friends that uh, everything else aside, philosophy should always be pursued, and this is his quote, with the, with the seriousness we had as children at play. And if you are around children much, you realize they really take it seriously when they play. Um, it seems to me that Peter Koch operates almost always in the spirit of Thaumatsein, the sense of wonder. And his sense of wonder is contagious. Uh, he loves nothing more than to collaborate with others he finds interesting. Poets, librarians, famous chefs, musicians, novelists, 60s radicals from Berkeley, and other printers. 
And he loves to connect people the way I imagine Socrates did, wandering the agora, thinking out loud, smiling and asking questions. And this, I insist, is the business of philosophy in the pure sense, as the Greeks conceived of it, the love of wisdom. What does this all have to do with Montana? I think, uh, whereas most Montana writers and artists seem obsessed with the notion of place, I think Peter has instead devoted his work to pursuing uh, you know, what's underneath the place, the being, uh, the way Heidegger did, another philosopher, Dasein, the being there, uh, or maybe the way another philosopher, Duns Scotus, thought of it uh, in terms of quiddity, the thisness of things. So there's a real palpable sense of this being that I think translates into a book, which is a palpable object that you manipulate with your hands. There's a, there's a there there. Um, so what I mean to say is that Montaigne figures as a place in Koch's imagination, as it surely must for anyone who lives here, but I think what he's after in the production of his books is the stuff that lies beneath all that, the substance of things and ideas. And naturally, this takes on palpable forms. And uh, one of my favorite stories about him is in 1973, he went up to Fairfield, Montana, just up the road here, and uh, picked up the remnants of the newspaper type in an old C&P Platten press. And I think he confessed to me he knew nothing about any of it, just knew that's what he was going to do, um, and started printing over in Missoula with it. And so to me, this is what's called applied philosophy. It's not you know, people sitting around in an ivory tower thinking about things. It's actually doing something. And so I guess in the pure sense of what I mean, academic debates about Marxism are one thing. And intellectuals, especially in my academic community, love to talk about Marxism uh, in the abstract. But actually going out and acquiring the means of production is a whole other thing. <laughs> Um, and cynically, somebody else said, uh, freedom of the press only applies to people who own a press. <laughs> <laughs> and so this brings me to the metaphysical part of this. And this has always been the most interesting part of his work for me. And that's the way he questions and interrogates the basic ways in which we encounter the world. Or a work of art or a book that is a work of art. And another philosopher, Hegel, observed that Wesen ist was gewesen ist, meaning the essence of a thing is what has already been. Um, and since the Greeks, philosophers have distinguished between being and becoming, this is an ancient debate in philosophy, uh, between what is unfolding and what has already happened or unfolded, and what is accomplished through that process. And before the invention of writing systems, this distinction might not have made much of a difference to people. Before they were able to preserve their words and statements in written form, all reality must have been more fluid, since our speech, like music itself, is ephemeral. It vanishes as quickly as our words are uttered. Writing, of course, changed everything. Now we can impose being on becoming. So when you're talking, it's just you don't even have to really think about it. Words just flow out of you. But once you put them to paper, then you suddenly have to stop and think about it because they're going to be preserved. It's now a thing. It has been. Um, and with this, the evan evanescent mystery of thought emerging through speech could be translated into a permanent record. And we could make shrines and idols of our thoughts and ideas which could be passed around intact. And language and the mastery of, of systems to represent it made, made humanity what it is and has become. So a big part of our being is the fact that we have language and can preserve it. Um, and in many ways, Peter Koch's work constantly reminds me, at least, of this simple truth. The essence of humanity is what we have produced, for good or evil. Um, and his Urtext project next door, the three volumes of that, to me, illustrates this as succinctly as anything that I can think of. It's, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, printing is called the art preservative of all art. Um, and I think that's true without question, but the philosophical import of that motto goes way beyond its obvious truth as an observation about the value of archiving beauty. In my mind, printing captures consciousness itself sort of in the act. And the printed word 
arrests the transitory insights of the thinker and delivers them to the future. Essence might be what has been, but once that insight is printed in a book, it erases time in a kind of real sense and gives the ideas themselves an existence beyond the thinker. Uh, incidentally, it's worth pointing out that uh, for this reason, Plato was very suspicious of writing. Um, like a canny lawyer or a venal politician, Plato did not want to put things in writing <laughs> uh, because he didn't want to be a called to account later. And yet, here we are 2,500 years later calling him to account for what he wrote. Um, and that's because he did write it down. And this leads me to what I think is one of Peter's most important productions, uh, most recent, the Speculum Mundi, uh, which means you know, a mirror of the world. Um, and to me, this is sort of the epitome of this philosophical endeavor with the book, that uh, it's a self-reflective compendium of humor, human enterprise laid out in book form, and it really does cover everything from religion to the nuclear bomb. Uh, but it's more than your typical book, or even your typical letterpress book, if such a thing exists, because in a sense it's the Liber Librorum, the book of all books, a book of all books that pays homage to the idea of the book itself as the most spectacular housing for human consciousness ever devised. It's a Borgesian delight, a veritable library of Babel that envisions our loftiest ambitions and our darkest horrors connected telescope fashion as part of a continuum. Um, and at one end you can think of you know, Dante's uh, uh, Inferno going down and then the Pardiso headed up to heaven. Um, or if you're familiar with science fiction, this guy Ted Chang's uh, Tower of Babylon story in which travelers who have sedulously climbed the Tower of Babel to pierce the vault of heaven find themselves transported by a wormhole back to right where they started. Um, which reminded me of T.S. Eliot in The Four Quartets, who observes this. What we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning, and the end is where we start from. And every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and the new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together, uh, to my mind is about as succinct a summary of letterpress in general, but the stuff that Peter is up to, especially with the Speculum Mundi. Um, and it's not by accident that he chose as his printer's mark, um, so you'll see this on the spines of the books, the little Greek snake eating its own tail, the Ouroboros. Um, the mysterious point of origin and the point to which his efforts always return, his personal omphalos, navel of the world as it were for Peter Koch, is always Montana. And to me that's the connection, the locus of his own conception, this place is the incubator of his incunobula, the last best place is where the owl of Minerva returns to roost in the rafters of the print shop. Uh, but now with the Speculum Mundi, the subject matter for the book of all books is humanity's own self-conscious yearning for the heavens. Not merely our many towers of Babel, but also think of Dante's Paradiso again, coupled with the diabolical alter ego that humanity seems to have, which is this impulse for self-destruction on a grand scale. And I don't mean merely Dante's uh, Inferno, but the technological prowess we've acquired along the way to harness the power of the sun, that is, in a word, the nuclear bomb. In this, this is in the Speculum Mundi also. So in a sense, that nuclear bomb represents the epitome of human striving. It's an amazing engineering accomplishment at the cutting edge of what human beings can grasp about the being of the universe, uh, the mastery of matter itself splitting that which was never meant to be cut. Adam in Greek means uncuttable. And then here we go and cut it. Um, and the bomb at the same time is an ontological nightmare, if you will, because intervening into the basis of being itself uh, requires us to re reconsider those words. It's uncuttable, but then we devise a way to cut it and make what many people would regard as doom incarnate. And it's also not lost on me that we're surrounded right now by all kinds of nuclear weapons. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but the end is in the beginning, and uh, Peter's Speculum Mundi reveals the totality of human endeavor includes both the invention of beautiful art, but also the specter of total annihilation. And one of the uh, exhibits over there is the Speculum Mundi open to the, um, what is the thing called that measures? The measure? Volvel of the... Right, the Volvel that uh, determines how likely you are to survive, how far from the blast. Um, before the invention of movable type, but long after the realization of the, of the book, human beings had already set for themselves the task of trying to capture the sum total of human knowledge and human endeavor. And because I'm a college professor, I remind students that if you got a BA in 1500, it meant you were a master of every, all human knowledge up to that point. <laughs> um, and now you not only get a major, but you specialize in a very narrow sliver of whatever that major is. But until very recently, people really thought you could archive all human knowledge. And already in the 13th century, so before even printing was invented, um, there was a book that, to, to my mind, is kind of parallel to the Speculum Mundi, called Speculum Maius, or The Greater Mirror. And this was a handwritten book in which this monk in the 13th century wanted to write down everything that human beings knew. Um, and like De Vo uh, the guy's name was uh, De Beauvais, um, Koch's Speculum Mundi also happens to consist of three parts. And, uh, well, the Urtext consists of three parts, of which the Speculum Mundi is the central core. Um, and the, I don't think this was a co or attempted again until the 18th century when Denis uh, Diderot tried to encyclopedize all human knowledge. And they got to 18 volumes and then uh, realized uh, we're probably never going to finish this. And it hasn't been finished. Um, and I have to put in a word here about Wikipedia, which to me is trying to do the same thing and surely has... Uh, gone much further, and for the people who sort of criticize Wikipedia, somebody recently did a study and compared errors in Wikipedia with errors in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and there's way more errors in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, part of the reason for that is that Wikipedia is open source and constantly self-correcting, like the scientific method itself. Um, anyway, I think Koch's ambition is different from the encyclopedists. Um, because his speculum is a mirror held up to the world not to reflect completeness or plenitude, but rather to probe. It's the probing mirror of the pathologist, an instrument designed to provide an illuminated reflection of the human condition, especially as it presents in the last stages of the Anthropocene, the age we live in, the so-called age of the human. Um, and I also want to point out that the word uh, mundi in Latin, the genitive singular of mundus, is the world, but it's the world as conceived uh, in distinctly human terms, so not the earth, which would be terus. Um, and uh, in doing the etymology for the word mundus, I found out that uh, one line of it traces it to an Etruscan word, which means pit. So that's... There's something ringing over there that's distracting. Okay, so in this respect, and to some extent, this is true of all the entries of Peter's voluminous catalog. Um, the Speculum Mundi, to me, captures the bookmaker in the process of becoming who he is. This is an ancient dictum in philosophy. I think it starts with Pindar, that you know, your goal in life or your, your obligation in life is to become who you are. Uh, the English poet John Donne in 1627, I think, took this a step further, and I recently came across this quote and immediately thought of Peter. John Donne said, he who desires to print a book should much more desire to be a book. <laughs> Part of Peter's legacy as a printer is surely to have plumbed in depth all the possibilities of the book, of what a book is and must be. Um, and in his own meditations on the Speculum Mundi, which he shared with me, um, it hasn't been published yet, but his own ruminations about what he's up to, he quotes Kafka, and maybe you've heard this quote, but I think this also summarizes letterpress book printing. Kafka said, I think we ought to read only the kind of books that wound and stab us. If the book we are reading doesn't wake us up with a blow to the head, what are we reading it for? 
But we need the books that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply, like the death of someone we loved more than ourselves, like being banished into forests far from everyone, like a suicide. A book must be an ax for the frozen sea inside us. And finally, we arrive at the end here, the third branch of philosophy, its only real practical realm, ethics. You know, the question, how should we live? And when Peter and the late Edwin Dobb and several others started uh, the extraction project, the fundamental driver was the environmental doom we have created, the way we have fouled our nest, as Jim Harrison put it. Um, if the anthropological age we live in is called the Anthropocene, the so-called age of humans, it seems that we have already entered the twilight of that age. And scientists seem almost universally agreed that an impending climate crisis of apocalyptic proportion looms over us like the sword of Damocles. And to find our way past it, um, humanity will have to suppress its suicidal tendencies and cultivate other distinctly human impulses, for example, making of art. Um, I know this sounds very hippie in uh, California. Uh, uh, but, I, but I do believe that, uh, you know, part of what's complex about human beings is they do have these destructive tendencies, but also artistic ones. And it seems like so far for the 5,000 years of recorded history, we've mostly been pursuing the destructive ones. And, um, I, you know, maybe it takes a climate crisis to wake us up out of it. Um, if we are to not merely endure, but prevail, as Faulkner put it. And so to me, there may be no better laboratory than Montana to conduct this extraction experiment, because Montana is a state accustomed to environmental degradation, a state consumed more and more each summer by forest fire and a changing climate. And I think Peter's philosophical bookmaking can provide an inspiration for thinking about all of these things and for thinking about what humanity means and for imagining how we should confront the future. Thank you very much. I hope I left time for questions if that. Did you, questions? Arguments? Right. You know, and, 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 and I think that the making of art, I mean, just look at this building, you know. Huh. Wow. I mean, you know, everything, most of the things that people do, including medieval castles and, 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 and manuscripts and, and uh, you know, factories that make canes for crippled men, you know, that, that's all really good stuff. And, and, and so I, I think that I know I'm a dark person, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to overstate. I didn't mean to overstate the darkness at all, and maybe I can mitigate it a little by pointing out that um, anyone who's ever seen footage of an, of an atomic bomb blast can't deny that that is on some level an amazingly beautiful thing if you separate it from the destruction and the poison that it involves. And the same, you know, we just went and looked at the dam uh, on the Great Falls. There's an industrial dam there. And I think on some level, my friend Charlie Rice, who lives here, he likes to go look at the dam, and he says to him, it's, there's a certain beauty to it. Um, so I, I don't mean to overstate the case that human beings are bad and we need art to save us. But in a sense, it is like that Peter Falk movie, uh, Tune In Tomorrow, where he says, uh, life is a shitstorm, and the only umbrella we have is art. <laughs>
That can be your new motto for the prescription. <laughs> Any, anything else I got wrong? <laughs> no, I really, I don't want to sound like I'm a gloom guy because I am pretty optimistic about it. And I think extraction, the whole point of it on some level is, I think I fairly said to, uh, you know, thinking, I guess I would put it this way for me and I'll speak only for myself. Um, there is an argument to be made that we got to stop global warming or whatever so that we survive as a species, right? But to me, that's not enough. And I, know if, I don't know if you've seen this movie, uh, Don't Look Up, but it seems pretty clear that no amount of saying we have to stop doing this or we're all going to die is going to solve the problem. And instead, I think what it's going to take is that we need to preserve the environment, not because it keeps us alive, but because it's fun to look at. <laughs> it's fun to go walk around in the woods. I mean, it's beyond survival, I guess, is what I'm thinking of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that all right? Oh, sorry. And I put it in my pocket because it was sliding off the. Um, so we're going to have about a 15 minute break. So come back in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, hello and thank you so much for joining us here on the live stream this evening. 3.07 p.m. actually in the afternoon. And we want to say a quick thank you to all the amazing sponsors who support our podcast. We are on a quick break as we get ready for our next speaker. Big thanks to Humanities Montana National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, you can check out more at arts.gov, the National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, the First Interstate Bank, Montana Woman Magazine, and D.A. Davidson, uh, Montana Arts Council, and so many other amazing sponsors. Thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, if I have missed any sponsors, I do deeply apologize. There are many, 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 and we are very thankful for each and every one of you. If everyone's tuning into the live stream this, uh, this afternoon, please know, yes, we are experiencing some Internet dropouts here and there. Uh, as we continue in, uh, understand those will be happening here and there, as well as the fact that uh, we are actually recording this at the same time, so that means that we will be able to play this back and upload it in a higher quality at a later date, uh, as well as maybe editing it down to simplify. If you have a desire for it for yourself, please let us know. You can just uh, get in touch with us here at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. Uh, you can ask for Nicole or Sarah and uh, let them know, and they will get in touch with the uh, team that put on this video. Thank you so much for joining us. Like we said, we are on a short break, and we will be back shortly to continue our wonderful conversation here uh, with Peter Coe, who will be our last speaker of the evening. But much, much, much more to look forward to right up next here on the live stream. Please share it out. Hit that like button. Let us know by leaving a comment that you're enjoying. And thank you so much for your patience with us.
Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream this afternoon at the Square, the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. It is such an honor to have you here. If you are enjoying the live stream when we're doing our uh, conversations here, please make sure to hit that like button, leave a comment. And uh, don't forget, folks, there is plenty more to come. Three more speakers that we're going to have uh, discussing this wonderful world of, uh, of typography and, of course, the art of, uh, of bookmaking and then some. Uh, just a beautiful realm that we're talking about today and lots to look forward to, especially with Peter Koch at the end of our evening here. We're live streaming all the way until 6.15 tonight with plenty of content uh, to bring to your attention. But as you may notice, our live stream is dropping in and out of Internet service. So please bear with us and make sure to keep an eye out later. We will be uploading a higher resolution version uh, later on uh, when we have the opportunity. That higher quality will be much more enjoyable to view and uh, much easier to view. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, certainly thank you so much for sticking around uh, as we continue this. We are on break right now. As soon as we come back from that break, uh, you will know it because we will jump right back into our video uh, and uh, get back to all the amazing knowledge that is being uh, uh, taught tonight. We'll be back with more here in a little bit right here at the Square, the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art.
As we continue on our break just a little longer, let's also tell you about a special event coming up tomorrow where if you're enjoying some of the topics that we've been talking about this evening, we have three more speakers to go, make sure that you also take a look at the Community Bookmaking Workshop tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. here at the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. There is a wonderful opportunity, this free community bookmaking activity, a letter to home, will invite learners to participate in exhibition tours and a workshop carried out by Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art uh, docents and educators organized by Eliza Weber, Director of Education. Learners will make individual pages for a collective handmade accordion book. Skills include incorporating traditional bookmaking techniques with personal narrative through written word or visual art representation in a non-traditional display. Once again, you can check that out right here at the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art at 1400 First Avenue North, Great Falls, Montana. We would love to see you here tomorrow, June 11th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We'll be back with more right here at the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art live stream as we get ready for our next speaker here very shortly. Um, welcome back, and thank you for taking a quick pause between um, discussions. Um, next, we and a big thank you to Aaron for his wonderful discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron. Our next speaker is Roberto Trujillo. He, um, let me get the correct title here because it's so illustrious. Uh, from Stanford University. He is the Associate University Librarian and Director of Special Collections. Francis and Charles Field Curator of Special Collections. He is here to share his experience with Peter and also discuss what the process is and what it means to have an archive and be an archivist. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for being here. Now, I'm pretty soft-spoken, so if I need to speak up, say something. Shout out. Speak up. <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, I had to go to a speech therapist for a whole semester in college because I was training to be a teacher, and I was speaking way too fast. And my therapist asked, why do you speak so fast? And I said, well, I have so much to say. <laughs> and they said, but Roberto, if you're speaking 300 words a minute, nobody's going to get it. And I thought, OK, you got me. So I had this whole semester of therapy to learn to speak more slowly <laughs> and to enunciate. So hopefully that will come in handy today. My talk is about Peter Koch 
as a printer and an artist and how I came to meet him and how he has influenced me. And I think I've influenced him to some degree as well. And I think if you think about it, you'll note that Peter has influenced Aaron considerably. And I think that Aaron has influenced Peter considerably. And when you hear Russell talk, you'll see the same thing, that influence and influencing. And I think that's pretty spectacular uh, when you have that, that, uh, that mix of, of people and minds coming together. I met Peter about 25 years ago at Stanford when I had first become uh, head of special collections. He introduced himself through, I'm not sure if it was a phone call or an email, but he came to show me a couple of artist books that he had collaborated on and he did the printing for. He was not the poet or the artist who did the illustration work, but he was this collaborative person. And uh, I said, I've never bought an artist book and I'm not quite sure what you want me to buy. So you're gonna have to be a salesman and educate me, but I'm perfectly happy to listen to you and to learn from you. And I know that you're a printer because you had done a number of commissions for uh, annual, annual reports for the Stanford libraries, and most of them were done letterpress. So that was a special feature for, for, for us. Anyway, I met Peter, I ended up buying, uh, he had two copies, two editions of the same book, one was in English and one was in Spanish. The poet was a Mexican, the artist was a Mexican, and an edition was in Spanish, and I bought the Spanish edition, of course. And then Peter said, why? And I said, well, we're in California. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> I should buy that one first. I probably want the other one as well, but I, I can't afford both this fiscal year. So I'll buy the Spanish edition now, and I'll buy the English edition when I get my new pot of money. So that's what I did, and that's how we met. And then uh, Peter invited me to have a drink on 4th <laughs> Street in Berkeley, a few blocks down from his, his studio. And that was the start of many drinks, over 25, <laughs> over, <laughs> over, over 25 years. But I learned so much from him in those after work sessions. Uh, and it was about him being a master printer and an artist and me not knowing a whole lot about either one of those things per se. My interest at Stanford was primarily in collecting manuscript collections and archives. And so jumping from that to a single object was a big deal. And then I realized that Peter was really obsessed with the letter form. And I thought, how could somebody be obsessed about picking which font and which letter form? <laughs> you know, like, how can that be? But you then realize that it's a big deal to pick very deliberately the letter form that you're going to use to make a word. And then you learn that Peter is obsessed with the word. And then he's obsessed with the line. Then he's obsessed with the geography of the word on the page. And the paper becomes important. And so you have a guy who's fussing about the letter, the word, the geography of the page, the paper, the ink, the binding, the package. And then you realize that all of these things are part of the message. And then an epiphany happens and you realize this guy's an artist. He's not just a craftsman, he's not just an artisan. He's mixed all of these things and he's turned it into an art form. And I thought, how can that be? And then I realized and knew that he was from Montana and like, how did Montana produce this? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm, not dissing, I'm not dissing Montana because I grew up in Cheyenne, Wyoming and in, and in northern New Mexico. So we're both kind of western country bumpkins. And so how did the two of us end up being at Stanford doing what we do there? And at Stanford, I and Stanford Libraries have collaborated with Peter for 25 years on on publishing and on exhibitions and on catalogs. Peter's archive is at Stanford. All of his published work is at Stanford. The catalogs that are in the little bookstore right next door here 
the material lumina and the book art object and Peter's catalog resume are all co-published with Stanford. So his influence on me, and I think my influence on him to let us at Stanford be part of this so that the rest of the world can know what it is to be a printer artist. And it's this collaboration that, that is really, really fundamental. And then, you know, Peter and Susan, his wife Susan Filter, started talking about, you know, Roberto, we have to have people like you from other libraries do what you're doing. And so Codex was kind of born. And so they had many more discussions about Codex without me, but many discussions about Codex with me. And I was always of the opinion that Codex should be a place for people like me to learn about people like Peter and for that to happen in a social setting where we can have a margarita or a martini or a glass of wine and where other people who are creators can gather in a marketplace so that people like me who collect for institutions and people who collect privately for themselves can come together in a rendezvous Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico kind of way where you have people intellectually interested in what creators have to say. And you come to realize that these creators are creating things because they have something to say. They're not doing it just for the heck of it. They've actually got something to say and they want to share it. And what better form to do that than a book? You know? And so over these 25 years, it's gone on and on and on with different projects and different collaborators. And because of Codex, as Aaron mentioned, it's, it's a marketplace where people from all over the world come and meet people like me who buy and build collections for research and teaching and people who collect for their own pleasure. And then we learn from each other. Uh, and that by itself is probably Peter and Susan's best, best legacy in terms of influencing and then being influenced because you learn from all of those, all of those people who come together teach us. They teach Peter, they teach Susan, they teach Aaron, they teach Russell, they teach me. You know, we, we come in and we grow together. And we've had, I think, 15 years worth of codex mm -hmm. at this point. How many? 17 years? That's a long time, you know. Uh, and it's made a huge difference internationally. Uh, Library of Congress comes, Yale comes, Harvard comes, Stanford comes, Berkeley comes, UCLA comes, Penn comes. Uh, pick your university. They send their curators to this marketplace and to this learning venue to learn about the book as an art object and how do you collect that for your teaching and research program wherever you are in the world. And so that's like, you can't buy that, you know? And that happened because people wanted to share and people wanted to influence. Uh, and people were dealing in the end with art. And art, you know, does something to your soul. Uh, it's not about business or money, although the marketplace of the fair is that because the creators do need to make a living. But I don't know that they come to make money. I think they come to share. And they, you know, if they're lucky, are able to sell enough to, to cover expenses at least. But it's not a marketplace to make money. It's, it's really a marketplace to share. Uh, when we were forming the Codex structure, you know, the, the book there, the symposia, and then the cocktail parties and the dinners are all part of it. It's, it's a cultural thing, I think, for book art people to want to do business over drink and food. <laughs> and so that's, that's important. Peter, you know, has kind of been the grandmaster of all of that. Uh, he's a little bit older than me, and so I had to learn a lot from him to become part of the world and engaged in it. 
Uh, the exhibit that's up at Stanford now is part two of the Materia Lumina, Lumina book catalog book that's, that's in the bookstore here. It's, a, it's what we argue are the 75 more important pieces of book art that have been exhibited somehow at any of the Codex book fairs over the last 17 years. And so how do you pick 75 works from two or 3,000? It's not easy. It takes a lot of martinis, a <laughs> lot of picking. <tequila. laughs> and then it takes these discussions of going back and forth. How do we, how do we pick? And all of the stuff that has been shown is particularly cool. And so are we judging people somehow in some unfair way? And in the end, we argue, no, we're not. We're just you know, showcasing 75 of the coolest, and there are another 75 that another institution can showcase, and another 75 that another institution can showcase. And so you don't have to have the catalog that we did be the end all of what is worth exhibiting in a catalog like that or in a, in a exhibition program like that. Uh, this program was at Stanford, it's up until the end of August, and then in September there's gonna be a comparable show at the Boston Athenaeum. And so this idea of sharing book art and the critical reception of that and acknowledging the individuals who do that work uh, is part of the game, you know, and it's for us to live and learn from each other. And so for P Peter's catalog resume, which Stanford is also a co-publisher of because we did an exhibit of all of his work, was it four years ago, five years ago? And for that catalog, I was supposed to interview Peter, and so I did, but I was doing a practice run on interviewing him when we were down in Mexico City together. <coughs> and Peter cornered me at one of the receptions and said, Roberto, what are you gonna do to me? What are you gonna ask me? And I said, well, Peter, you have to understand where I'm coming from and what you have taught me over the years and how do we share that with other people? Because I think, like me, others would want to know. And so I wanted him to explain without embellishing a history or making it sound greater than it is, why he was obsessed with the letter form, the word, the page, you know, art. Why he was obsessed with the book as an art object. And how did he want to share that with the world? Even though sharing it with the world is kind of a weird concept because the editions that most book artists produce are small runs. 25 copies, 30 copies, 15 copies. So that means 15 or 20 people or institutions in the whole world can have that work. That's not a lot. But if those institutions, you know, or libraries like mine, where you have a constant turnover of students every year, it guarantees, in my, pers in my opinion, a continued critical reception. And so Aaron's reception of Peter's work and Russell's reception of Peter's work is theirs now. But what are Russell's and Aaron's students gonna say about Peter's work two generations down from them? That's gonna be quite interesting. Are they gonna have a similar response to Peter's work or Russell's work or Aaron's work? They're all printers and creators. I'm the only one that does not do that. I just collect it. And so I wanted to not just talk about that because we're lucky to have the exhibit at this museum, you know, across the hall, and you get to see some of this work that Peter has produced over the last 45 or so years. And you'll have gotten to hear from Aaron and Russell about his influence on them. And I thought, well, since Peter is here, and they're here, and I'm here, and the works are here, maybe we should hear a little bit from Peter as well. And so I wanted to repeat some of the questions that I asked him in Mexico some years ago <laughs> and see if the responses are the same. <laughs> see if I've changed my mind. <laughs> see, see if he has backtrack on anything and the first question that I asked him you know was Peter you are fascinated with the letter form the word the text and the codex 
and your fascination has led you to transform the way in which these elements communicate with each other through the materiality of the printed object. For you, working with paper, ink, design, and printing is not, just, it not, is not just high craft, it's art. Your study of the history of printing and the book and your willingness to exploit new technologies for making of the book mark you in a singular way as an artist and perhaps more concerned with the art form than you have ever been. And the question was, why? <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, I need your help. <laughs> and then why, the, the follow-up question to that was, why is it important for you to create as you do? Mm. And I actually mm. really wanted to know that, you know? I really wanted to know that. Yeah. And so I think Peter, his response was several pages long, but <laughs> can you respond to that question that was asked so many years ago? But I think you constantly think about it. Well, and if you paid attention to Russell, I mean, to Aaron's talk earlier this afternoon, he's mm -hmm. paid attention mm -hmm. to it. So there's something to this guy that we, should, <laughs> that we should pay attention to because he has a lot to share. And I think it's not just something that he's trying to sell, he's trying to share it. And it has turned into an art form of sharing and an art form that is his books. So Pete, speak up. Well, <laughs> um, you know, Aaron was talking about the, the more or less metaphysical and, uh, and uh, I mean, some of the philosophical issues that he felt that I dealt with is, um, and, and if you ask, I think anyone who, well, unless, I'm not, I'm not gonna ask Bobby. I have, I am deeply challenged by um, having an idea and, to, and trying to figure out whether I can make something out of it. I mean, it's, it's I mean, deeply challenged. I mean, it's like, if I don't do this, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna enjoy the rest of my life. You know, I think I'm gonna be a failure. You know, and I'm gonna be, you know, and I'm going to be worse off, and and so, but, but because I've had this idea that I wouldn't call it brilliant, let's just say that it became enough of an idea that it's like a, a, a floating down a river and you don't know how to swim, and this log shows up floating <laughs> next to you, and you just like <laughs> grab it, you know, just you don't think about it, you just grab it because it's an idea, and and in the sea of chaos, where where you know how our minds work, so so almost against this sometimes, you know, you, you say, oh, how am I going to get out of this depression? You know, well, let's see, I better, uh, let's see, maybe I should go gardening or maybe I should, uh, you know, maybe I should call my son or maybe I should uh, walk the dog. You know, uh, for me, the challenge when I was young and I was 40 years, 30 years, 35 years old, was, uh, you know, to, to get to do something that, uh, <clears throat> that, that was a, a, a revealing of who I am. And, and I wanted to reveal who I am, and, or was at the time, because I thought it was such a good idea that I had, Once the, especially at the point where I developed it. And I'll give you an example, real quick example. Um, as a student, I was fascinated by the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, of which we have about 200 little short fragments, some, the longest one's a sentence. And most of the fragments are less than a sentence. And I was fascinated by it because, uh, because, because of all the emptiness that it left to think about. So, you know, I would read this fragment and I would go, God, this, this leads me places. Hey, this guy makes me think. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was obsessed with it for a while and, you know, liked it. And, and then one day I had a dream and I wo woke up. I mean, I had this dream in which I'm in a library in... The Middle East in sandstone, and it's probably you know 2,000 years ago. And I'm, I'm I go into the library, and I say, I'd, you know, "Bring me Heraclitus," because you know he had written a big book, but the book didn't survive. Just these little shards and fragments, 200 half sentences. He said, "Bring me with Heraclitus." I'm in my dream, you know, <laughs> and this monkey sort of person, you know, because we're in a, probably in the, the Library of Alexandria or something. He goes into the darkness and he comes out with a book and he lays it out in front of me. 
and I saw it in my dream, and I did not forget it. What it was is it, it, is a, it was a book that was made of broken up leaves of papyrus, handwritten in Greek in, with black ink on papy leaves of papyrus, but they, the leaves had been bound along one edge, and then it was smashed between two boards. And it was about this tall, and it was about this wide, and it was about this thick. And I, bam, and I opened it up, and shit, I woke up. <laughs> I was gonna get, you know, I mean, it's like, oh, you know. I mean, Moses was a lot luckier than I was. You know, he had the dream, and God spoke to him. Right? You know, I opened the book, and I walked right up. But I then realized that I had an idea for a book that maybe never existed, but I, had to, I could make it exist. So, so then I, I, I got the Greek type made. Not, well, I didn't in this case. I mean, I had the Greek type cast by a foundry in uh, remote New Hampshire, the only foundry in the world that I could find that had this one Greek typeface that I wanted. And then I had another foundry in, um, um, in, <clears throat> in uh, Marin County in California, print the English on the other side of the page, the Greek here, English here. And then I had some paper hand painted and I, had, I found a paper that I liked and pretty soon I had the book. But of course it was only 200 fragments instead of being this thick like the real book was in my dream, it was only this thick. It was a tiny little thing, 200 lines times four, you know, or, you know so roughly. But that turned out to be a big hit. People really liked that book. And, and one, of the, one of my best friends at the time, uh, well, still a very good friend, but you know, one of my better friends uh, who could read Greek and all of that, he told me that he thought that that was you know, like a really incredible book. And I, I had to agree with him because I thought it was incredible because I'd re it's a, it was a retrieved dream object. Yeah. Another question that I asked Peter, and I think he's been speaking to this question already, but I, I tell him that his work is is a cultural production that must become part of the cultural record. And do you consciously recognize this as a responsibility? And for me, it's a question for me because as a director of a special collections library at a major research university, which has the job of collecting the cultural record, what responsibility do I have to collecting this dude's stuff? And if he didn't create things that were worth or merited collecting, where would we be? But I clearly felt that his, his work is part of our cultural record today. And so because of what I do in my research library setting, I have a responsibility to collect it. But the real question is, I think you sense a personal responsibility to create that cultural record. He's nodding yes. Or well, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that. I mean, to, just to be uh, you know, flippant about it, you know, I played right into his hand, right? I mean, I mean, you know, there's a guy collecting stuff, you know, for for, for the for future scholars to read. I said, oh, okay, I'll make some of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I was acutely conscious uh, growing up as a child. I mean, growing up here in Missoula, in Missoula acutely conscious of of history, family history, and archives and special collections because um, my great-grandfather's letters are held, he wrote them, uh, you know, in 1860 and from Fort Musselshell in Montana to his family, uh, his cousins and his uh, uncle uh, in Louisiana and they were recent immigrants from Denmark and all of these letters ended up Instead of being dumped, you know, this 600 or more letters, they went into the archives and special collections at Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, because there was a, one, of, one of my ancestors, you know, daughters, uh, never married and lived, outlived absolutely everybody, and, it, and she became like 100 years old. And what am I going to do with all these old letters? Because no one ever threw them out. And she wasn't about to throw them out, so she just, they went to the university. And a scholar that I wouldn't know uh, in, during World War II was, um, couldn't do his scholarship where he wanted to because of the war. And so he was stuck 
in Louisiana. And he needed a project, because being a scholar, he needed original material to work with. And so he went to the library and said, what do you guys got? You know, I'm stuck here probably for four years. What am I going to do? You know, what's the material I can work with? He said, well, we have this Koch collection of letters. You know, that they were just letters. They hadn't been transcribed or anything. He started reading them, and he became fascinated. He became so fascinated that he, he published article after article in historical journals, you know, little bits and pieces and shards of my great-grandfather's letters back home. But he even got so obsessed that he wrote a novel about my great-grandfather that was never published. And, and, and I found that novel because only simply because I knew he had written these articles and I was interested in my family history. And I was interested in archives because I prowled through them all my life, it seems like, because I was a university hog and I couldn't get enough. And I lived in the library and worked in the library. And I, I said, I called the university where he had retired from. They said, well, hey, he's still alive. You want to talk to him? And I called him up, and he answered, hello. You know, I said, this, my name is Peter Cox. He said, oh, are you related to, you know? And I mean, he was 90-some years old. And he said, oh, you know, I wrote a novel about your great-grandfather. You know, it's, it's in my papers at the library. I gave them to the library. You know, he's kind of old and doddering like me and now. And he just said, if you want it, I'll give it to you. So I said, oh, cool. So I've been playing into that cultural record because my great-grandfather did. And also, I could tell you similar tales about my grandfather and my father, and also my great-great-great-great-great-great-great, all the way back, because we were a very literate family. We came from the, the priesthood, more or less, in Denmark. And you know that meant you had to go to the university and study philosophy and theology and and you know or anything that you could study. Um, you know you had to be a doctor, but to get to get to the high position in the church, and they all were there. And 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 I just and I always thought that I needed to measure up, Roberto. I thought I needed to measure up to my goal, and my goal was to be worthy of my own family. Uh, you did. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this, this next question is a loaded question, especially for all of you people who are from Montana. Uh, and I asked Peter, I stated that part of your aesthetic is what you've termed cowboy surrealism, maverick, maverick poetry, and frontier philosophy. But those notions beg to exclude the evidence that is the history of printing and the book over centuries that your work reflects and is informed by. The Montana influence is certainly a hook for differentiating you from other master book printers, and there is certainly a there there, but how does the influence of your Montana sensibility weigh on your world of fine press printing and design? And I was actually curious, this whole Montana aesthetic that is part of Peter's, and then he deals with Greek typeface. And, you know, he has been influenced by old masters. And he's taking that influence and giving it a cowboy twist, a cowboy surrealism, <laughs> maverick poetry. And he did it. And we're all here enjoying it. But I was always fascinated. How did this crazy guy get away with doing this? And it's not crazy. Over 25 years, I've come to realize what that is. But I, I think other people would want to know of a response from him because he's a world-class master printer and book artist. But he's from Montana. And he has... Montana in everything that he does, as Russell, I mean, as uh, not Russell, as Aaron, Aaron uh, yeah. stated earlier, there's Montana in all of this work, and to me that's fascinating. So, cowboy surrealism, yeah. ma maverick poetry, yeah. frontier well, philosophy. Well, you know, I, I, I was very much couldn't wait to get out of Missoula. I didn't need to leave it behind me forever. I just needed to get out. 
and, and see the world. And, and I was very fortunate in that um, um, I, I, I came into a little bit of money when I was 21 years old, enough to send me on a nine-month binge in Europe and North Africa. And, and um, that's what I did. And, and in the process of going there and, and, and always, wh who, do we, who do I hang out with anyway? Strangers, weirdos, artists, writers, poets, painters. That's the whole, the people that seem to, you know, we all seem to like meet each other. I mean, if I could be sitting in a cafe at the Cafe de Paris in downtown Tangiers. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there all by myself, you know, there's nobody around, you know, that I could, would know, nobody. And, you know, I open up a conversation with the guy next to me. Oh, that's William. Uh, my name is William Eastlake, and I've written these five novels. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, my grandfather once wrote a novel, you know, and the next thing you know, we're chatting away. You know, th this kind of thing would happen to me over and over and over again. I mean, and I, I always felt that, that, that uh, 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 the humor of, 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 of people who may not be from the West, but who are looking at the West, it's, it's a kind of, it opens g doors for me, you know, because I, I wanna know how other people see me. I know how I see the world, right? I, it's easy, you figure it out yourself. You just look out and you say, oh, you know, that's, Norman McLean said, the farther you get from Missoula, the higher the incidence of bastards. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that's a childhood thing, right? You know, two guys talking to each other, brothers and sisters, and, you know, they've decided anybody from Butte's a piece of junk. You know, Great Falls, you've got to be kidding. You know, in Hamilton, they're, you know, Hokies. You know, we're from Missoula. <laughs> you know, and I, but I grew up thinking, you know, that there was, every kid in the world was just like me. And so, you know, Russell would have the same experience from his household outside of New York City. Aaron and I became, you know, bestest friends because we clearly had this exactly the same experience in Montana. But plus, we had the same pr philosophy professors, and and yet, you know, we, we you know, we reach out and we find our our way through the, uh, you know, through through the labyrinths of of, of of chance and circumstance, and we find our friendships. And I found my friendships amongst people who are interested in things like Greek philosophy and surrealism. Oh man. I mean, just uh, today I saw my second excrescence of surrealism in Montana, uh, I've all, the, the, which is at the uh, Ursuline, because the, the gargoyles that sit on top of the tower of the Ursuline is actual, uh, you know, sort of like dream sculpture in a way. Of course it came from the Gothic and all that, but I had seen on Last Chance Gulch as a kid um, the Atlas Block building that has the salamanders around the onion dome. And I would look up at that as a kid and go, that is so cool. And I was rebelling at being a rebellious child. I rebelled all the time against whatever it was that someone was trying to feed me. So I, was, I had the worst school record, dropped out of everything, got Fs in half my classes, and As in the other half. If I liked the teacher, I got an A. If I didn't like the teacher, anything about that teacher I didn't like, I got an F. And I, I would... I carried that on to the point, you know, to such a, a crazy extent that pretty soon I would run out of things to do in Missoula. I just burned it up as far as I was concerned. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm moving to New York or Paris or London or San Francisco. Or, and I did it over and over and over again, you know, for 30 years. I just moved back and forth. Well, not 30, 20. But, you know, I always came home to Montana because, because fight as hard as I could, the balsam... The balsam arises, the, the larkspur, the, you know, the lupin, the, you know, the, the cutthroat trout, the eagles, the, uh, the smell of the, of the ponderosa, the, the, the smell of the cottonwoods when the, when the creek is flooding. The, um, uh, you know, I mean, those things are just, they bring me, they make me the most happy thing in the world, in the world, to go walking on Rattlesnake Creek in the flood stage, you know, and fight my way through the willows you know, and, 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 and smell every, every, every flower. And so when I got a little, I, I'm going to keep you, I'm gonna, i got to stop. Okay. <laughs> and we're almost out of time for my session, but I'm going to give you one little factoid about Peter. From 1986 to 2006, Peter taught at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley a class titled The Handmade Book in Its Historical Context. And I frequently get asked by students, because of today's technology, what is the future of the book? 
and I have a colleague at Stanford who teaches a class on the history of the book, and her line is, the history of the book is the future of the book. And I really believe that, and after having interacted with Peter for 25 some years, it just reinforces that all the time. And he's making books all the time. And that is, I think, the future of the book. And that's not to deny digital copies of things or digital access to things, but it's not going to replace the book, I don't think. So anyway, we may have a couple minutes for a question or two, do we? Do you have questions, especially for him? Yeah, for me, uh-oh. You said the first time you met him, you bought the Stanford book. Yeah. Did you ever buy the other book? I did. Okay. <laughs> I did. Peter was really happy that I bought both. <laughs> and, yeah. But the, the theme was, you know, this was an example of a collaboration between Peter as a printer, a Mexican artist who did the illustration book, and then a poet who was also, and they were based in San Francisco and Berkeley, and they produced these incredible books. And what was the edition? Do you remember what the edition of that thing was? Probably about 30. 20, 30. And 15 so, of each. And so they're, each all, language. they're all gone. So 30 institutions or 30 people in the whole world have that, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. You know, I'm going to make that's a cool. comment about that okay. smallness of edition, because mm -hmm. I constantly get uh, comments from people who uh, are hostile to the idea of a book costing thousands of dollars. And it's brand new. It's not $24, and it's not $17. And I mean, I'm constantly badgered by people who don't like that idea. They really don't. And, and they, they, they come to me and they say things like, I, I won't even tell you what they say, because some of it is it's, it's so bad. And, and the only thing I could say is, is that, look, I'm just doing this the best way I can. And I, I can only make 30 of these before I drop dead with exhaustion, you know, and it took me 10 years to make this book, and I only got 30 copies, but they're just the way I want them, and if you can't afford it, can you afford a Van Gogh? No, but you can go to Amsterdam and look at a Van Gogh, Van Gogh, you know, you, could you got a Charlie Russell in your dining room? No, you know, but you can come to the Great Falls and see one, so, you know, this is my only excuse, not excuse, but defense is to say, well, I'll find out where the copy nearest you is that's in a public collection, and I'll send you the address and the name of the person who's the curator, and you can go visit it. <laughs> that's that's, that's yeah. really cool. I, I once juxtaposed a book, an artist book that I bought for $15, next to a book that I bought from a very famous sculptor, Manuel Neri, which was $95,000. They were in the same case, in the same library. And like, okay, student, talk about it, react to it. I mean, like, it doesn't have to be a multi-thousand dollar volume for you to learn something from. It can be something that's $15, $10. Yeah, yeah. And the book is the book, you know. But the book has to have a message, and the person who wrote the book or made the book is the messenger, and this is the medium, and so. Mm -hmm. My favorite book of Peter's, and I say it's because I'm looking at the, po the Sacagawea book, which was a collaboration with you and Deborah. Deborah, who's here, who's Montanan. And when I first heard about him working on that book, I said, well, where did you guys find this manuscript? And he said, well, there isn't one. I said, well, then what are you doing calling this the Journal of Sacagawea? And so you then learn about the collaboration between the printer and an artist and a poet, and how do you give a message even without a manuscript, you know, by studying and knowing a culture. And that critic, I mean, that's still one of my absolute favorite books. Oh, so cool. Anyway, I think I'm done. So, thank you. Aaron has a question. Aaron, you had a question or a comment. Um, well, first a comment. I, I want to say the Lost Journal of the uh, Second Degree is also the Mecca of the Book. So you pull up a copy from wherever you get to the library in Zealand if you want to go see the, the 
That's right. There's only one. There is a copy in Missoula at the at the at the at the, at the, at the public library. Hmm? Oh, that's true. And there's another copy in Dillon, Montana. At the, is it the Western Montana College? Yeah. 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 There. Uh, 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 yeah, that's right. Ro Roger Dunsmore. This one right here. Yeah. Yeah. There's one in the exhibit. You had a comment? Uh, I just have a question uh, following something uh, Roberto talked about a bunch of times in books, and I forget where you said this, but somewhere here you talked about how some books are like uh, suckers that you catch when you're going back. <laughs> Yeah. You had a comment or a question? I mean, you can look at them, to read them, to touch them. At Stanford? Yes. Oh, of course. So precious. They're, they're precious, but you they were made to be touched, to be okay. read, to be smelled. Because the feel <laughs> of the paper. Absolutely. And so, important. yes, in any research library, yeah. they're there to be yeah. studied, I've, read, okay. touched. You can go to and this a, a rare freshman, library, and they'll bring you the book. A freshman put it down doing a little 10-page paper has as much access to that book as somebody working on their dissertation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think most libraries who have copies would treat them the same way. They're there to be had. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to so take a little break. Oh, thing, go ahead. One thing is all this everyone's saying, especially this last piece with Roberto and Peter, is going to be set up for my little slide talk. It's going to show you how you make a book like that. Every In case you haven't noticed, Peter loves what he does, and I love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, listening to Roberto and Peter in their discussion. Um, we're going to take another momentary break. And just as a, as, so everybody understands, based on the conversation that was had, is that the works that Peter has in the archives at the University in Missoula, all of them are currently here at the square on exhibit. So if you want to see his true works in real life form, they're here at the square. And that's the important part of this lecture series is the exhibition of Peter's work so that we can see it, we can live it, and we can listen to the and words. And you can access it, yes. And you can access it. And I had a question about, is there a chance for us to see it by appointment? Yes, by appointment. If you contact me, we can look at it individually. Okay? So thank you so much. And, we, and come back in just about 15 minutes, and we'll continue our series. Thank you. Very big thank you to all of our amazing sponsors. You can see some of them here on the screen. I'm pretty sure we might have missed a few. I do apologize if that is the case. In saying that as well, my friends, uh, please understand right now that we are experiencing some dropouts on our internet connection. We do apologize about that, but remember that there is going to be a uh, full high resolution video that we will attempt to uh, get to you in other formats at a later date that uh, we are recording as we are doing this. Thank you so much for watching. We will be back here in about 15 minutes. And we thank you so much for taking part of this experience and learning the artisan craft of, uh, of this beautiful letterface book, uh, book creation. And don't forget that tomorrow there's going to be a really fun class 
that's going to happen right here at the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. You can find out more information on the Paris Gibson website at v-square.org. v-square.org. We'll be back with more here in just a little bit in about 15 minutes.
like that type Welcome of back, everyone. <laughs> this is an exciting time. Everybody's chatting and having a great time. So thank you so much. Um, and today we're going to continue with our lecture series here for Peter Koch, the book as a work of art. And we're going to introduce to you Russell Merritt. Come on up here, Russell. Quickly, I'm going to introduce him so that not to carry on and get to the point, right? right. So Russell, Ma <laughs> Russell Merritt is a book artist and letter designer working in New York City. Merritt's books and manuscripts are in public and private collections throughout the world. Thank you for being here, Russell. Oh, happy to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, um, I met Peter Koch when I was 18 years old. Um, and since then, he has been a teacher, a mentor. And, and when I was thinking about it, uh, strangely in the bathroom just now, um, <laughs> the, uh, I realized that he's my oldest friend, um, and, uh, uh, which is an interesting phenomenon. And, and, but so knowing Peter since you were 18 means that you've heard a lot, a lot about Montana. <laughs> um, and I've never properly been here before, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to finally get to drive around this state with him and see all of the things I've been hearing about, and, uh, and the people I've met and the places I've seen, uh, it's just been extraordinary. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, and um, I'm gonna give a, an illustrated talk about my sort of take on Peter's work. Um, and it, it's kind of hard speaking third in an event like this because the two previous talks were so interesting that I just want to talk about them. Um, <laughs> but, the, uh, but I'm not going to do that. And I've got a script and I'm going to stick to it uh, with maybe a little ad lib, uh, a few ad libs. But um, a few years ago, Peter asked me to write an introduction to a volume of his bibliography, which he titled Against Design. And for months, I struggled with the question of why a designer would choose the title Against Design for a monograph about his design work. <laughs> then one day I woke up and realized that the reason Peter chose that title was to provoke each of us to ask ourselves a si simple question. What is design? And following on the erroneous principle that simple questions have a simple answer, I came up with my retort, which was design is the self-conscious arrangement and presentation of information. Which is true, of course, but as I thought more about it, my definition became less and less convincing. It accurately described what design entails without offering any real insight into design's raison d'etre. How do we move the slides here? Ah. Page down. I'm trying all of those. <laughs> How many technicians does it take to fix a computer? Right. We're up to three. We're up to three. Oh, How about oh just click. click on it. Oh, okay. Click. All right. Well, that sort of ruined the flow there. It accurately described what design entails without offering any real insight into design's raison d'etre like defining a nail as nothing more than a thin piece of metal that is flat on one end and pointed on the other. It's just not enough information. Um, to be understood, you need some explanation of how or why it is used. And so design certainly does involve the arrangement and presentation of information. Um, but if that were all it was involved, we would find it strange that design could inspire enough passion to cause Peter to identify as being against it. You don't take a stance against the presentation of information, not unless you want a short career as a reformer. <laughs> you might take a stance against the manipulation of information, but how boring is that? Instead of either of these, Peter's rebellion against design manifests itself in his graphic rejection of commercial design priorities. 
More than a thing, Peter is standing against a motivation. In order to understand Peter Koch's work, then, the real question to ask is not what is design, but why is design? And the cynical response is easy to predict and not entirely wrong. The why of design is to sell, and the how of sales is to often to deceive. The classic lipstick on a pig approach that allies the designer with the advertising executive, with the snake oil salesman, on and on down the list of hucksters and frauds until our poor designer is but a hapless functionary of the military industrial complex. But as I mentioned three sentences back, this view, though exaggerated, is not entirely wrong, but it is simplistic and unilluminating, so we'll just put it aside for a moment. Let's instead entertain the idea that design entails the location and articulation of specific qualities in information or objects, qualities that resonate within specific groups of people. The potential beauty of design is giving voice to those qualities so that they resonate more clearly and more broadly than they, might other, than they otherwise might. The critical distinction is found in the motivation of the designer, the qualities he looks for, the audience he tries to reach, and the ideas that he serves. It is not surprising that most designers look to the world of commerce for these things, but Peter looks elsewhere. His work is not so much a commercial venture as it is a personal endeavor. The traditional private press version of giving resonance to ideas goes something like this. The goal of the printer designer is to locate the specific qualities that make a text great and to give them their best voice for the glory of the text. Okay, I'll try this one more time. There we go. Which certainly sounds admirable enough, but is that really what the great private presses were doing? Do we still believe this narrative of the printer servant toiling away in inspired subservience to the text? If we consider the individual outputs of the Kelmscott Doves or Ashendine presses, do we see a collection of different books whose designs are tailored specifically to their texts? Or do we see a collection of similar books whose designs are determined by the meta vision of their makers. <clears throat> For instance, here we have two Doves press books. They look exactly the same. The one on the left is a text by T.J. Cobden Sanderson from the early 20th century, and the one on the right is by John Milton from the 17th century. Um, and so it begs the quest question that if these books are printed in the same typeface, on the same paper, in the same binding, can their design be said to be motivated by honoring the specific text, or are the texts employed to realize the printer's vision of what an abstract great book should look like? I would propose that the great private presses are great not because of their service to their texts, but because of what their books reveal about the printers themselves. That the true narrative of the private press book is the self, and that it is this quality, despite any idealized claims about commerce, that distinguish the design work of great printers from the field of graphic design. It is through the self that great designers are able to forge a connection with something timeless in their work. And inasmuch as Peter is against design, it is because he looks inward when the graphic designer looks elsewhere. The problem, and it is a slight problem with the great presses of the turn of the last century, is that they began making books only after their selves were largely formed. We see their vision in their, in their books, but we do not see the development of that vision played out in their work over time. What distinguishes Peter Koch's work is the long arc of personal growth that we are able to watch unfold within it. This is particularly gratifying because for most of his career, we would not refer to Peter as exploring his self so much as his several selves spread out as they are in a scattershot of space-time loci, post-Lewis and Clark, Montana, pre-Socratic Greece, post-war Bay Area, Renaissance Italy, with layovers in various bohemian hotspots around the world throughout time. It has only been in the last 10 years or so that the intellectual and creative tissues connecting these various selves have unified into a unique polymathic self. 
When I first got to know Peter in 1990, he was at a pivotal, pivotal point in his career. For most of the previous decade, he had been concentrating on jobbing work, trying to make a living as a letterpress printer in a high-rent metropolitan area. There was never any doubt that the book, capital B, was the driving force behind his printing, but as most printers know, the impending zero bank balance can be a ruthless taskmaster. <laughs> Unlike most printers, though, Peter only printed job work that he designed, and his designs were unique in their diversity of aesthetic inspiration, uh, 60s surrealism, European modernism, hermetic philosophy, incunabula, whoops, how do we go backward now? Oh, it works, huh. Um, you know, you, you just need to kick it right. Um, California Fine Press and Incunabula. From these inspirations, Peter began to assemble a vision or visions of his graphic selves. And these jobbing years were also Peter's formative development as a book designer, bridging the handsome but modest books of his and Shelley Hoyt's Blackstone Press and Peter's more expressive experimental work that was yet to come. The chronology is startling. 1979, we have Handbook of Ornament. 1987, we have Point Lobos, which if you haven't seen this book in person, it's big enough for two people to have dinner on. Um, uh, that's in 1987. And then in 1990, we have Heraclitus and Apre Heraclitus, the Deluge. Comparing Handbook of Ornament and Point Lobos is a study in contrast, so I'll go back so we can see that. Um, and at first glance, it's hard to imagine that they were designed by the same person. But on closer inspection, both books display a steady typographic restraint that gives their pages a fresh contemporary feel. They're tightly controlled and beautifully printed but that is where their similarities end. And it is because of the differences between these two books that it is easy to place Point Lobos at the head of Peter's new books. Um, but I consider Point Lobos to be an interstitial work, a sort of bold announcement of arrival that ultimately is more closely allied with traditions outside of Peter. And this distinction is important because although Peter has made many books, there is a central body of work that stands apart from the rest. And it is with Heraclitus that this body of work begins to take form. So how did Peter get from Handbook of Ornament to Point Lobos and Heraclitus? It is no secret that printing is a practice makes perfect kind of craft. But what is less obvious is that there are many different kinds of practice. If a printer only makes his own books, for instance, it can be tempting for him to design books with his own particular talents in mind. Job printing, on the other hand, creates situations in which a printer is challenged in unexpected ways. Now, for those of you who might not know, job printing means printing things like invitations, uh, books for Stanford University, whatever, whatever you want, you know, uh, books, commercial work, um, uh, as opposed to the art, you know, the art. Um, and so the challenges of job printing play out against the incessant backdrop of speed and economy. You have to deliver a well-printed job on time or you don't get paid. It's a compelling formula that produces two important results, rent and mastery. Print enough commercial work and there comes a point when a printer no longer needs to exert him or herself to produce a well-printed job on time and it becomes second nature. Rather than struggling with the labors of printing, the printer's mind is suddenly freed up to concentrate on the conceptual import of their work. And if you look closely at the oeuvre of any printer who has enjoyed a long career, you can pick out the moment when this has occurred, the moment when their work becomes emboldened by their printer's technical mastery. And the sheer variety of books produced in the 10 years after Heraclitus speaks to this transition. They are confident, they're technically diverse, and they're conceptually rich. And so if we consider a partial, just a partial list, Heraclitus translated by Guy Davenport in 1990, um, uh, Unsought Intimacies by Tom Gunn, 1993, oh, whoops, 
Why are we going that way? Um, uh, Diogenes to Fictions by Thomas McEvely, lettered by Christopher Steinauer in 1994. Urtexts, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Um, uh, sorry, this is confusing me a little. Uh, both in 1994. Ode to Typography by Pablo Neruda. Oh, that's the detail of the binding of her text, Volume 3, right? Yeah, that's Volume 3. Yeah. Right, okay, I'm sorry. Speculum Mundi is Volume 2, but it's the last one to be produced. Um, um, Ode to Typography by Pablo Neruda. Personal by Robert Creeley. Zebra Noise with a Flatted Seventh by Richard Wagner. This is only to 1998. Hard Words, Portfolios 1 and 2 by Peter Koch, both 2000. And Samo Chopai by Franco Ferrari Delfino in 2000. Um, so within 10 years, this is all produced by one artist. Um, and while all this was going on, Peter also established the Hormone Change Last Chance imprint, um, began work commissioning a new hand-cut Greek typeface for the fragment of Parmenides, and put many other projects into motion that have come to fruition in the years since 2000. Between 1990 and 2000, we see all of Peter's selves coming to the fore staking claims beside each other in his intellectual landscape. The books of this period exhibit a rigorous inquiry into Peter's relationship to his craft, into Peter's Western heritage and his fascination with the exploration and exploitation of the American West, into his love of pre-Socratic philosophy as manifested in his attempts to give artifactual form to the Greek ph philosopher, philosopher, philosopher poets, and into his latent and ongoing dialogue with the forms of the Italian Renaissance. Throw in Peter's consistent program of publishing contemporary poetry, which grows out of his Montana Gothic and Blackstone Press days, and I could easily be, des be describing the work of five printers rather than one. In the 26 years since Peter published Heraclitus, those five areas of typographic and bibliophilic inquiry have developed simultaneously in decreasing isolation from one another. For anyone who has known Peter or his work during this period, it no longer seems odd to juxtapose Parmenides, Deborah Magpie Erling, and Joseph Brodsky, because Peter has been able to expose what is universal in all of their texts. And he's been able to do this through intense concentration on what connects these diverse traditions within himself. Although Peter has made many books, it is his Greek, Italian, and Western books that bear closer examination, because in them we see the development of Peter's vision and his contribution to the contemporary book most clearly articulated. So how do you typographically represent a pre-typographic language in the post-typographic era? <laughs> Throughout the typographic era, the answer to such questions was simple. You print the work of the Greeks in the finest typefaces of your day. From the Aldean Greek to Victor Shoulderer's New Hellenic, each period of the typographic era offered its own interpretation of the Greek page. And each of these interpretations, in turn, embodied the art historical DNA of its period. So what happens when there are no new types? And when I say that, I mean no new metal types for letterpress printing. Or at least not, uh, yeah. Um, Peter offers not one, but three eloquent answers to these questions in his pre-Socratic books. In Heraclitus, the solution is one of typographic illusion and contrast. On the recto of each spread, Guy Davenport's translation is printed in monotype Bembo, in Aldine-inspired typeface. The choice of Bembo is not particularly daring, but it is mo what most contemporary readers would expect to use, be used to print a uh, Greek translation, a humanistic Renaissance-inspired typeface that does not overwhelm the reader with its forms. But the choice of Bembo takes on a new layer of visual complexity when considered beside the Greek text, which is set in full caps in Gil Sands' light. 
The epigraphic quality of the Greek sets off particularly, uh, perfectly against the bembo, making the bembo feel more lively than it is and the gill sands more immutable. The illusion is further accentuated by the use of sand-colored paper and gestural terracotta paste papers on the Coptic binding. On opening the book, you experience a visceral connection with the text that goes far beyond the literary. You are not simply looking at the text, you are in the presence of it. This visceral quality is cut to a rough edge in Peter's edition of Diogenes' Defictions. There is no Greek in the book, and Diogenes is not even a book per se, but a self-styled text transmission object. Nevertheless, the same high level of attention is, is paid to the embodiment of the text. Instead of referencing monumental epigraphy, Peter focuses on the more personal forms of handwriting. How do you print pre-typographic text in the post-typographic age? You throw out type altogether. And again, a sans-serif letter is used, this time written out and controlled but irregular strokes by the letter carver, uh, Chris Steinauer. The texts are then debossed into flexible sheets of lead, the material onto which curses were scratched in antiquity, and then housed in roughly fired ceramic boxes. And there's an archaeological quality to Diogenes that is heightened by the mild discomfort of handling a box full of lead. It is both beautiful and unsettling, like Diogenes' texts themselves. In the fragments of Parmenides, Peter draws elements from both of these books to create the most monumental of the three. Once again, the English translation is set in an Aldine-inspired typeface, Giovanni Martyrstag's Dante. The Greek text is set in the epigraphic typeface Parmenides, a type that Peter commissioned from, to be cut in punches by Dan Carr. So this was actually cut in steel punches, struck into matrices, and then cast as a new metal typeface. And the Parmenides typeface is neither overly rough like Steinauer's lettering in Diogenes, nor is it quiet like the Gil Sands um, in Heraclitus. Instead, it sparkles with human intelligence. And where the Gil Sands stands still, Parmenides dances. It's hard to see in this slide, but if you look at it closely, it's a remarkable piece of work. Um, the book is the only one of the three to be illustrated in the traditional sense with five wood engravings by uh, Richard Wagner that pair perfectly with the Greek type. They too dance on the page with a life and vigor that defies their medium. Looking at a page spread of the fragments of Parmenides puts you into contact with multiple streams of historical endeavor, each of which echoes with unheard melodies. As a typographic book, Parmenides is a coda it extends the typographic tradition of printing Greek texts in new metal type 50 years by its perceived expiration date, or beyond its perceived expiration date. Each of these books exhibits a kind of fearlessness in its design, one that is keenly aware of but unencumbered by typographic presumptions. As a result, each fulfills that old adage about the printer working in subservience to the text but in refreshingly contemporary ways. This sub subservience is achieved through extreme introspection. No other printer would come up with these three solutions, each of which draws on Peter's comprehensive typographic knowledge and grows out of his personal view of the fragmentary, beautiful, and often haunting monumentality that we see carried throughout so much of his work. Um, now, in this section, I'm going to talk about the book that Susan will be talking about at later, but I think I come at it at a slightly different perspective. So, uh, no Western printer who began printing in the 20th century can avoid a dialogue with the Italian Renaissance. Swineheim and Pinartz, Jensen, Ratdolt, or Aldous, take your pick, but one or more of them is going to appear in your work. Their forms are woven into our DNA as printers from the moment we read our first Stanley Morrison essay, German bad, Italian good. <laughs> it is an ideology with a remarkably firm grip and one that often produces beautiful books. The Italian vein has been present in Peter's work from the outset of his career 
but it is the most recent to come into its own. So to section off Italian as one of Peter's selves is a bit disingenuous. His uh, Heraclitus and Parmenides both reference the Aldean tradition, as do bits of, and pieces of his other books. But one of Peter's explicitly Italian books rewards a closer look. To paraphrase Coleridge, Venice is more properly romance itself than it is a particularly romantic city. And like all tr truly romantic places, Venice cries out for tragedy. Whether the city is sinking or not, loss is everywhere present there. This fact has produced a lot of bad art, and it makes working with Venice as, su as a subject matter difficult. Even a photograph of a plain Venetian wall can come off as being overly romantic. In his edition of Joseph Brodsky's Watermark, Peter has managed to capture both the romance and the loss that characterize Venice without succumbing to either. The work of Aldous Minucius is the obvious graphic sta starting point for any Venetian book, and in Watermark, Peter runs fully in the Aldean direction typographically. But the su success of the book lies in Peter's careful combination of derivation and deviance from the Aldean model. First, there's the scale. At 11 by 16 and a half inches with long lines of Dante type, watermark is considerably larger than the Aldine folio. Rather than portable and utilitarian, Peter's book is monumental, and it is this monumentality that counterbalances the romantic aspect of the other tradition referenced in watermark, the Grand Tour, with its omnipresent views of Venice. The text is illustrated with photogravures made from snapshots by the American Venetian painter Robert Morgan, to whom Brodsky dedicated the text. The images are small, snapshot size, with the same image backing up with itself on the recto and the verso of the same folio. So as you turn the page, when you're looking at the spread, you see this on the right-hand page, and then you turn the page, and this image is printed in exactly the same spot on its back. Um, elements, but what happens in that moment is that elements that were in the image on the recto are missing in the verso. So you see the vaporetto here is gone there. Um, so in the turning, in the brief moment it took you to turn the page, time has elapsed and something has been lost in the process. There's a quiet elegiac aspect to this experience that puts you in contact with what it feels like to travel through Venice. In Watermark's illustrations, Peter also goes against the Aldine grain, the very essence of what makes the Hypnorotomachia polyphily such a milestone of design is its seamless integration of text and image. In Watermark, these elements are consciously and conspicuously separate. They are in dialogue with, but distinct from one another. And this dialogue is emblematic of the many dialogues between history, memory, landscape, and meaning that occur throughout the book. Watermark is less experimental typographically than Peter's Greek books, but it is no less powerful in its ability to capture complex typographical, historical, and emotional information on the typographic page. It also ties into his other work in its innovative use of photography, we don't typically think of a private press printer as using photographic imagery as his primary illustrative medium. But through Watermark and his Western Americana books, Peter has used appropriated and altered ph photography to great advantage. This should say Western Americana, not Western American, but you know. Um, so if Peter Koch can be said to have multiple graphic selves, they all grow out of and are steadily melding into the central mythic narrative of his life, Montana and the American West. To say that Peter identifies with his childhood and heritage in Montana would be to grossly mi misrepresent the situation. Peter's relationship to Montana is more along the lines of the relationship most of us have with our blood types. Montana courses through him. One of the benefits of coming from an out-of-the-way place is that when you arrive in the capital, you do so free of the capital's prejudices. One of the downsides, which is not always a downside, is that in some sense you will always be an outsider. 
And both of these social dynamics are abundantly present in Peter, and each manifests itself in alternately surprising and expected ways in his work. <clears throat> when Peter began his Western books, there was an unmistakable yippie ki I'm sick of this pretty Italian shit <laughs> aspect to the work that had more to do with the whim his whimsical ephemera than with his other books. And this attitude carried through his early hormone deranged broadsides to the development of the deep drive buckaroo letterpress persona and into his first organized Western publications, Hard Words 1 and 2. The Hard Words portfolios consist of what Peter calls one word picture poems that pair photo engravings of people or a bleak landscape with single words that are evocative of a pioneer existence hard, froze, shot, lost, etc. Peter describes these prints as his, quote, attempt to reformulate the custom of issuing wanted posters. They may very well be that, but they are also an articulate rejection of the pretenses of fine printing. They are statements of identity by someone who identifies with being from outside. There are important differences between hard words one and hard words two. In the first portfolio, which we see here, the engravings and words are printed letterpress in black inks, blacks, reds, and oranges. The compositions are reminiscent of wanted posters and frontier newspapers, but their color pairings are unexpected. They make you take a second look. In the second portfolio, the idea of fine printing is turned entirely on its head. Instead of printing directly from the engravings and type, the materials themselves are photographed and then digitally reproduced. The photographs of the photo engravings take on an eerie tintype quality and the wood and metal types are unabashedly scarred. They become artifacts of the lost world they are referencing. In 2005, this vein of Peter's work took on a deeper resonance with Nature Mort. The portfolio uses the same basic format as Hard Words 2, historic imagery with photographs of lead type set in single words, backfire, crowbait, freeze out, etc. I think I've got a couple of these. Whoops. Um, rather than drawing on his personal collection of engraved portraits, the historical images in Nature Mort are culled from the Montana Historical Society each one picturing what Koch refers to as a, quote, unnatural disaster. Wildfires, smoke belching mines, dead bison, corralled Native Americans. The starting narrative of the, of the work is the Lewis and Clark expedition, but rather than celebrating the enlightened journey of exploration, Peter concentrates on the devastation left in its 200-year wake. Comparing nature more to hard words is one of those instances in which we get the pleasure of seeing a vision develop over time. Both are serious works, but where hard words evinces the spirit of the bad boy squib, nature more presents us with an epic vision of the West that transcends time, place, and persona. The field of dead bison could just as easily have been the field of Troy. This mounting epic vision of Peter's Western books is carried through and broadened in his two most recent, uh, the, Lo Sorry about that. the Lost Journals of Sacagawea by Deborah Magpie Erling and Lieber Ignis by Adam Cornford. The scope and haunting beauty of these books defies description. They need to be handled, paged through, and read to be fully appreciated but the opening lines of Sacagawea does them a certain distant, uh, justice. Quote, there is no fever like the fever of white men building. Um, now when I say these books need to be paged through, I really do mean it, and I would encourage everyone to make an appointment here to look at them. I mean, looking at books, a handmade book in a vitrine is like looking at a loved one in a coffin. You, you, you know, the, everything that animates and makes the book live is, is not present anymore. It's, it's frozen in a moment in time. And I really can't encourage you enough to look at and read these books. Um, 
But as late books um, within the scope of a printer's career, um, sorry, I'm a complete Luddite. Um, Sacagawea and Liber Ignis echo backward through Peter's work, revealing diverse sources within his earlier books. The dark materiality of Diogenes is reflected in Liber Ignis. The same basic elements of watermark are used to startlingly different effect in Sacagawea. Beyond these material antecedents, Sacagawea and Liber Ignis weave together the complex of Peter's selves into singular creative works. All roads, it seems, lead from Athens to Rome to Butte, Montana. I'll just go through a couple. This is, so Liber Ignis, the images are printed on lead sheets that are sewn onto uh, pieces of industrial felt on which the text is printed. Um, and uh, um, the, you know, Aaron spoke so eloquently about the, his, Peter's most recent book, Speculum Mundi, and the, the you know, all of these books lead up to that book, and all of these books um, are present in that book. And when you describe Speculum Mundi as the sort of culmination of a 40-year career, a 50-year career, that's really what it is. But these books uh, were fundamental steps along the way to making that. Um, and so looking back over the 50-year career, uh, uh, Peter Koch's career is a dizzying and satisfying endeavor. During that time, we see the development of a graphic approach that is determined by an intensely personal and evolving worldview, rather than by abstract notions of ideal books or commercial graphic design expedients. It is a process of discovery that can feel like a ride on a runaway train, a thrilling, nail-biting encounter with an artist hell-bent on forging a connection between his interior vision and the world outside. With each new book of Peter's, this process feels less like an attempt to give voice to universal literary and artistic themes and more like the universal themes themselves. To paraphrase Coleridge again, Peter's books are more accurately art than they are particularly artistic books. Thank you. I think I've got a couple more spreads, yeah. Isn't that a lovely one? Yeah. yeah. And this book, I mean, not only is it, you know, lead, you open up the box and it has a warning sign, you know, that it's with a skull and crossbones, but it weighs, like, I mean, 30. 30 pounds, you know, and uh, um, I have a copy and it, it's just, it's, um, you really, with works like this, you really start to understand the idea of the book as a work of art. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an object that you need to devote time to. It's not casual. There's nothing casual about it. Just getting it out of my bookcase is hard. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, and very few people are fortunate enough to have it. And so like a painting or a sculpture or a piece of music, well, that could be recorded, but you have to travel to go see it. Um, and it's worth, it repays the effort. Um, so, here we, are in Great Falls. here we are in Great Falls. There's the, um, there are the falls. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, and I know all kinds of private details about Peter's life, so. <laughs> Ask away um, yeah. if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, uh, well, I'd rather not speak about that. Um, uh, the, uh, God, I've forgotten. You know? What's that? Oh, yeah, that he's been, that, that uh, the, I, I have a, I was born and raised in suburban New York in a, in a house that I was desperate to get out of. And, uh, 
And from zero to 18, my 18th birthday, I was known as Russ. And at, in August of 1989, I got on a train in Grand Central Station for San Francisco. And the first person I met on that train, I introduced myself as Russell. And I've been Russell ever since. And I have no connection with anyone from, uh, that isn't family from pre th that train ride, prior to that train ride. Um, and of the people I met in San Francisco, Peter is the only one I, that's either alive or that I'm still in contact with. And so he is, in fact, my oldest friend. Um, and uh, so that was the insight that I had. Um, and uh, um, so being here, you know, it, it's very interesting to have a relationship, a 33-year relationship with someone that's very intimate and hear them talk endlessly about a place that you've never seen, you know, so it's, uh, um, uh, yeah. In your study of this passion, of this format, yeah. what is your favorite part of the process from what he does in his creation as you watch the work and seeing it, it transpire? What's the part that inspires you most to get to you? Well, I, the, I think it actually, Peter sort of touched on it, that a, a lot of these, um, especially the Western Americana books, really did sort of start out in a way that felt like him just grabbing onto a log afloat in the river. You know, it's just like, oh, I wanna, you know, I, I've gotta do something with this, and, uh, and I don't know what it is, and I'm just gonna start. And then over time, with each one of these publications, the, they just, the resonance just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And so it's a, you know, you get to watch. What I love, uh, we were having a conversation. Someone said, uh, you know, if you don't learn from a book, it, uh, uh, you should throw it out or it's not worth reading or something. The, um, uh, what I love seeing is I love seeing an artist learn from their work, and, uh, and I feel like that's what you see in Peter's work, you, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and with the Italian work, for instance, the, um, you also see a lot the influences, you know, before Susan came along into his life, he was all about Greece, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and it, I think it's fair to say that, you know, that has been tipping toward Italy ever since Susan came into his life. And, uh, um, and, the, uh, and so, you know, it's just the, the, the experience of being able to, you, you can develop a kind of knowledge and intimate relationship with someone through their work, you know, even if you don't know them. And, uh, yeah. That's what I'd say I'd like most. I want to take a second just to make an anecdote about Russell since he's been able to talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a day uh, when uh, in New York City, and I'm stealing this <laughs> story from Susan, but we, we, we made a date to meet for lunch, and Susan hadn't met my former apprentice and student and now printer in Manhattan. And I hadn't told her anything about Russell. I just said, you're gonna meet my friend Russell. Nothing about him, she didn't know. So we, uh, we climbed these zillion stairs to this Japanese restaurant <coughs> down in the, I don't know, whatever it was, the village. And, Soho. And evidently, at one point I left the table, uh, probably to the men's room, and Susan turned over, to, started to have her private conversation with Russell. She started by saying, well, what, what is it that you do, Russell? <laughs> and uh, Russell just, like he's talking, he just you know, turned to Susan and said, well, same thing that Peter does, only better. <laughs> <laughs> now, Susan has called him 
to his face and behind his back, mostly behind his back, the stinker. <laughs> Ever, Ever since, since then. So if, if we say that we're going to, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do something, and she's, oh, with the stinker? <laughs> so from Russ, we have translated <laughs> to the stinker. From Russ to Which Russell is, to stinker. But yeah. The, uh, um, the, uh, yeah, and that has become a... By the way, he's right. He's, he's really, really better at most of the things I do than I do. <laughs> I told you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So what is your point to give to those veterans that still didn't have any at home? Yeah, yeah. It's, or it was, are you it, going to? No, no, no. So I, uh, so I wanted, I thought I wanted to be a poet as a teenager. And what that meant to me was that I needed to drop out of high school, lie prone and smoke as many cigarettes as I could, have as many girlfriends as I could, and uh, and become an alcoholic. You know that was like, uh, and um, and I managed to accomplish all four of those things. And, uh, um, and but after uh, um, after about five months of being a dropout poet who wasn't actually writing poetry, but was unloading trucks at the CVS pharmacy at three in the morning and living with his parents. Uh, I, I, they, were, they used to have these huge books that listed every college in the United States. They were massive. And I just, in desperation, started flipping through it. And there was a page for this school that had everything I wanted. It was New College of California, 3,500 miles from home in San Francisco. You know, I had a poetics degree, which I didn't even know what that meant. And it had no entry requirements. If you just paid, you could go. And I, my parents came home and I said, I'm going to college. And they were so happy because they didn't want me lying around, you know, blasting the Smiths and smoking cigarettes in their house all the time. And, uh, um, and so I arrive in San Francisco with no real intention of going to school. And, um, and uh, and, but, you know, I show up and, and there are all of these like really horribly printed signs around the building that are uh, advertising this printing class in a sort of Marxist vein that like poets take control of the means of production and print yourself, you know. I thought, oh, uh, you know, that sounds interesting. And, uh, and I went down and I, and, and I signed up for a class and I, cranked the printing press for the first time and it was the it was alchemical it was completely transformative it was the first thing that I ever did that I wanted to do again um, in in the work related world I wanted plenty of cigarettes but the uh, um, and uh, uh, and other things but the um, uh, but it was just it just changed my life and and I um, and it was a, a sort of crummy little intro class um, taught by a guy who sort of knew how to print. And, and, um, and then they, there was this other class that people were taking called, taught by a man called Peter Koch, who, uh, um, who got $5,000 for printing a book, you know. And, uh, um, and it, his class was called Book as Object. And I and it was so enticing because my whole being just screamed out, "What the fuck does that mean?" You know, <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. And sorry, excuse the language. Um, and I, um, and the next semester I signed up for the class, and by the end of the semester I had dropped out and was um, sort of hanging around his studio. Uh, and I, um, and I've been doing it ever since. It, it's, I had the perfect collegiate experience. I found uh, what you know what I love to do, and have, and have pursued it ever since. So it was. Com and but uh, as far as serendipity goes, the one year that I was at that college was the one year that Peter taught at that college. So it just was, um, yeah. So no, there was no intention except that, oh, this is how to get my parents to pay for me to move to San Francisco. <laughs> that, and, uh, and then it all just worked out. Um, yeah. Very good. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks. 
Uh, anyone else? All right. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing about him, just for fun. <laughs> this is that uh, Russell's work is, um, uh, is so internationally sought after that his last, the last book that he did, he hadn't gotten halfway through it, and not only was he sold out, you know, but there were people like probably, you know, already, you know, optioning people who they knew were getting it, saying, well, you know, when you die, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have to tell you that it's, it can be like that. It can, it can be like that. I mean, um, I, I know of uh, one man in Germany whose book called Mexico uh, became sought after by one of the greatest collectors in the United States of contemporary uh, books, in, you know, uh, like what Russell makes and what like I make. And he's a really big collector. I mean, he big in the sense that he gets it, he knows how to collect. And so he kept badgering, uh, 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 Tobias is his name, kept badgering Tobias, I have to have a copy of Mexico, I have to have that book because that, I'm a completist and that's the one I don't have and I have to have it. He said, oh God, you can't get them, I don't have one. Finally, Tobias relented and he conned it out of his mother. <laughs> <laughs> probably given his mother a copy, you know, but it, by then mom was, you know, like through with it. <laughs> but that's, a, and, and, and one more quick quip about collecting like that. Wait, I thought you were talking about me. Hmm? No. <laughs> that was about you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so <laughs> Russell and I trade books. He, he makes a book, I make a book, we trade it back and forth. But as much as I would like to be a completist, there's a vast amount of his work I'll never see because they, they, it just disappeared into the maw of these collectors that he had collected. And, and now, uh, you know, if I want to see it, I have to go to the Library of Congress. That's, that's just how it goes. <laughs> or, in many cases, at Stanford with Roberto because Roberto has been very aggressive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I, you know, as far as the salesmanship of, do we have a minute or are we running out? Oh, we're way behind. Okay, well, that, I won't continue. Anyway, there are lots of tales, and, uh, but I really appreciate being here. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> We just need to talk. Thank you very much, Russell, for your presentation. And um, I like your title, Runaway Train, which is what I think the two of you are. <laughs> Runaway trains that collided and, <laughs> and really since that point have created a, a magnificent works of art and conversation with one another. So thank you for sharing all of that together here. We're going to take another break. We're going to make it a little bit quicker this time. And we're going to have a presentation by um, Peter and his wife, Susan Filter. And they're going to speak to us about one of their works, Watermark. So thank you. Thank you again very much for watching our live stream. If you've enjoyed this, please make sure to hit that like button. We'd greatly appreciate it. Consider following us. Hit that like button on the Paris Gibson Museum of Art Facebook page. Hit that follow button so you get to see notifications when new everything is coming out. Don't forget about tomorrow. A wonderful opportunity happening right here at the Paris Gibson Square Museum where you can be a part of making a book. It's going to be great for your kids. It'll be a ton of fun. You can go and check it out. 
on the-square.org and just click on events. The-square.org. Click on events. Humongous thank you to all of the amazing sponsors. I'm pretty sure we don't have them all listed here. I do apologize. Humanities Montana, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, the First Interstate Bank, Montana Arts Council, Montana Woman Magazine, D.A. Davidson, and many, many, many more humongous thank you to all of the sponsors who make these sort of trainings uh, and teachings uh, a wonderful reality. You know what? It's wonderful to share the history and legacy of someone simply loving their passion. It's a wonderful thing, and more that the uh, Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art wants to continue to share into the future for generations to come. So in saying that, if you've noticed our internet dropping here and there, uh, it's unfortunate, but we are doing our best. We are recording this in all of its detail. We will upload that in the future to our social medias where you can see it uh, in high resolution detail and uh, hopefully without skips, bloops, or, uh, or bops. So simply keep it uh, tuned in right here as we like to say on radio, but certainly just keep it right here and we'll enjoy our next speakers in a little bit. Peter Koch himself and his wife. We'll be back with more in just a little bit here at the Square, the Pixon, uh, Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. We'll be back in a bit.
Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we're about to begin again here in just a moment. Thank you so much for your patience during our breaks. We're looking forward to this one, especially Peter Koch and his amazing bunch of artwork wrapped around the idea of books. Absolutely fantastic, beautiful stuff. And now we're going to learn a little bit more about some other projects, something called Watermark. It's time to begin. Let's get right to it. and welcome back for that short little intermission. Um, thank you for being with us today in, in our lecture series. We're going to continue here with a discussion and conversation with Peter Koch and Susan Filter. Um, so please come forward, the two of you. It's exciting and we want to, keep, we want to be able to keep, capture your, your, your attention. Susan Filter is a professional paper conservator. Um, and she has worked on various collections throughout the United States, works of art that you wouldn't have imagined been able to, be, to have been touched. So her professionalism and um, Peter Koch's understanding of books and paper have brought them together in life, and here they are together to discuss their adventures in bookmaking together. So I'm g what I'm going to do is uh, just say a few brief yeah, words off the cuff uh, to introduce Susan to you uh, and, and the meaning of, uh, of how it is that we created this thing together really briefly. I had written a nice long piece of it that I timed it and, and I knew that it was going to last exactly 4.3 minutes. And I, but so it's been so well said already over and over again by my friend uh, that I think what I want to just do is tell you that uh, 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 something that about the impossibility of printing, uh, uh, the possibility and the impossibility of going to Venice to print a book. Um, and and, and to, to make the long, very long story short, we went to Venice, we met her friends, I met her friends, and I couldn't believe that, uh, you know, an, an American girl like this could be like a Venetian. But we got to Venice, and next thing you know, I'm in a palace. And the person who owns the palace is like her best friend. And then I'm in another palace. And then, oh, the guy that owns that palace? Oh, well, that's her other best friend. And, and they, they weren't just like rich Americans owning palaces in Venice. These were families that had ruled Venice for seven to 900 years. You know, so, so I mean, we, you know, she brings me into Girolamo Marcello's home, and, and, and Girolamo has a, has a three-story library, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know that, that is the history of, of Italy, and, you know, and, 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 but is his Marcello. I mean, go to Rome, you know, you know, from the Roman period, they've been, in, they've been rulers, you know, and, 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 but these are just people that she casually met because she opened up her home, uh, you know, to a, a girl who needed a, a, an apartment to get out of the house. Well, she, the house that she was getting out of was like a palace. Okay, but they became best friends, and, and Susan is a marvelous cook, and, and next thing you know, all of this girl's friends, you know, who were all of these noble people in Venice, uh, were showing up at her dinner table to have dinner with her because she was <laughs> gracious and cooked. Okay, well, and it just kept going like that, I, you know, I gather, for many, many years. And th then we met, and then she told me about this guy, uh, uh, Joseph Brodsky, who was uh, uh, you know, a really good friend of hers, and of course I'd heard of him, he was a world famous uh, Nobel laureate poet, essayist to die for, and she said, well, you know, when he was writing this book Watermark, which is about Venice, you know, we were like dating, and I <laughs> gave him the title of this book, you know, as a, you know, blah, 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 you know, they were in conversation, they were, they were friends, and then the person that had introduced her to Brodsky was also her a best friend, and still, a best friend. Brodsky died a few years uh, before I met Susan, uh, but I, you know, just to give you that brief feeling that it's impossible to go to Venice and do something like that, but through her connections and the kindness of her friends, we were able to put together something that was, could have been a lifetime dream had I had the imagination to have dreamt it before I met her. <laughs> 
thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, he, he told part of, part of the introduction I was going to talk about, but um, everything you learn today is going to be, so, you're going to sort of see the, the iteration of it. And um, Can we get that image to fill the screen? Um, we could, maybe. Do you know how to do that, to make the image fill the screen? There it goes. There it is. So this is a very romantic story, and it's about Venice. And, of course, Russell said Venice is very romantic. And it's a romantic story because this is about uh, how you make a book from beginning to end by hand. So everything I'm going to show you, and we also had some fun, uh, is how a book is made. And this is a, because we took so many pictures of every aspect of, our, of the work, it really shows how do you make a book by hand. So I lived um, for some years in Venice in the 1980s. And um, we all know this great printer, Jack Stoffaker from San Francisco, who had put, he had printed a book in Verona. And I said uh, to Peter, I know the perfect, he said, why don't we print a book in Venice? because I'm always trying to figure out how to get back to Italy for the longest period of time. You know, I lived about 10 years, but not all together, you know. So I thought, oh, good, you know. And so I said, I know the perfect book, uh, Watermark by Joseph Brodsky, who is a friend of mine. It's a short book, and it's uh, lyrical essays by a poet about Venice, you know, someplace I really love. And uh, so, oh, I'm going to show you a picture of there. Did it go? No. No. How do you... I'm pushing the forward arrow. You might need to zoom out first. Oh, zoom out first. Okay. No. No. Okay. All right. Let me see. There. So that's Joseph Brodsky, back in the '80s. When I knew him, he was a really he was a Russian, very nice guy with a really good sense of humor, and. Uh, so I said, oh, Peter, let's, you know, do this book. And then Peter said, where are we going to get a press? Uh, where are we going to uh, put the press? And where are we, where are we going to live for, you know, a couple of months? It's going to take a long time to do, time to do it. I, oh, okay. He said, well, you know, we can't do it. So this is the commercial copies of Watermark, just to show you in many different languages. And it's only, a, it was only a book about that big. And... Uh, there's uh, Joseph Brodsky, and this is my friend Bob Morgan, the painter he was talking about, who actually ends up illustrating the book. And what better place to print a book about Venice than a city whose symbol is a lion with holding a book all over, all over San Mark, San Marco. That's the symbol of Venice. So we go to meantime, we go to Venice just for a visit, and there's a fantastic museum called the um, Tipoteca Fondazione Italiana that's a kind of <coughs> a museum of type and printing presses and we're visiting the director and he's showing us around and out of the blue Peter said I want to print a book in Venice and I'm kind of looking he just told me we couldn't do that and this director said we will lend you any printing press in this museum anyone you want. He said, why don't you do it here? Because we have everything here in this museum. And Peter said, no, I want to do it in Venice. So he said, okay, we will put the press on a boat. We'll put it on a truck. We'll put it on a boat and we're going to bring it to you. Oh, whoa. So here's these beautiful presses. Oh, I have to go back one. Uh, so we think, oh, well, now we have a printing press. So we go back to my friend, uh, Palazzo, <laughs> and Peter says, well, we have this printing press we can get, but we don't have a place to put it. And she says, oh, go talk to my cousin who has this graphic arts school. Maybe you can put it there. So we go over and talk to Matilda. And she said, oh, yes, you can have this studio for visiting artists. Oh, so now we got the printing press. We got the place to put it. Where are we going to stay? So Bob Morgan's wife ha was just uh, now working with a new foundation that gave artists apartments in Venice. He said, let me talk to Ava. Oh, yes, we can give you an apartment. 
and any printer that kind, kind of comes along and helps you. So now we got the printing press, the place to put it, and a place to stay all within a couple of days. Oh, so now we're gonna go to Venice. So we go home and the first thing we have to do, of course, is have the paper made. And this is uh, a paper maker in um, Indiana. It's called Twin Rocker Paper. And we ordered 1,200 uh, 1, sheets of handmade paper. That's a lot of paper. So this is, I'm now just going to go through this process of how we make the book. And I'm not going to explain every little thing because it would take forever. Uh, so uh, we have to have the illustrations for the book. And Bob Morgan, uh, the painter that lives in Venice, he uh, and Brodsky dedicated the book to him. I think, oh, perfect, Bob, we'll have Bob do the illustrations. Well, Bob paints, he didn't draw, but you need something graphic to be able to print it letterpress. So it can't be a painting, it, you can't translate that to letterpress. So Peter talked to him about photographs that he'd taken over the years of Venice, and this is one of them, this is Venice in winter with the snow, it's very evocative. And we had them translated into photogravures, which are actually, it's a printing process. You actually print them. Every plate has to be hand uh, wiped and inked and then printed. And you actually go through an awful lot of paper because there were some mistakes. And every day Peter would come home and go, oh my God, that's, you know, that's $12 a sheet, you know, the people are throwing it out the window. So this is the printing. So we're printing the illustrations now in Oakland. Three months. Magnolia editions in, in Oakland. 30 copies. There are 35 copies we made of this book. Three months, three printers, so months, that's this. So then Peter's thinking of the design of the book. And you've heard a few people mention um, Aldous Manicius, who was one of the great Renaissance printers who lived in Venice. And one of, you know, people just bow down because they love this particular book. It's the Hypner Rotomokia, Polyphony and a very enigmatic Renaissance book that was printed in 1499, and Peter loves this book. So this is just going to be his inspiration. But he's not going to make little books like the commercial copies, the watermark. He's going to make a monumental book, like this big. And this is going to be his inspiration for the design and the layout of the pages. And uh, one of the great things about um, Aldous is that he liked to shape the, pa shape the letters, and so it's these beautiful pages uh, but Peter didn't want to copy that exactly. He only did a one page that's um, shaped. But uh, and we also he has to pick out the typeface. We talked that you know they've talked about the typeface and how important that is. And this is uh, Dante, a typeface that was um, designed in the 1950s by um, Meitersteg in Verona, and it's patterned or after Bembo, right, Peter Bembo. So it's a renaissance kind, it's a kind of a renaissance type. So this is this beautiful, strong, instead of, having, you know, in a little book like this, it's a gorgeous, uh, and you'll notice these little dingbats here, or not dingbats, these ornaments, ornaments? Asterisk. Asterisk, well, that's very Aldine. You had to have, find those, especially in Switzerland. So, okay, now we got to get the type. And there's only one uh, place that casts type one foundry left in Venice, you know, the cradles of printing. There's only one left, and it's the Monotipa tipa, Tipia in uh, Milano, Oliveri. There's the machine. It's a monotype is um, when you cast the type and all the, uh, the letters come out, you know, in the, in the right way in the le uh, as the book reads, but it's... Um, you have to space it out then later. So anyway, this, we have Italian ladies typing it in, typing in the manuscript. Because they're Italian, they're misspelling some words and they're getting some things wrong. So it has to be a lot of um, editing. And it comes out on this kind of a computer roller. I don't know what you call that. This paper tape. Paper tape. <clears throat> and that's the lead that goes into the, um, to the machine. And this is the matrix, so the letters go in this and then it spits it out in the right order. So 
now we got our type going and we got our paper and we have our illustrations so that gets all sent to Venice and so we go to Venice which is you know the most beautiful city in the world <laughs> to me and we go the next day we go out to the um, museum the typograph the tipoteca and here comes the type it's been sent from Milan they're getting it what is it, about a ton of type Peter coming in on this little gurney here. And there it is, tied up. On, that's a page, but it has to be spaced out by hand so that it's going to expand like this. So Peter's looking it over. They're all excited. Now he's picked, this is the printing press he picked. And this is Danilo, who uh, was the technician and printer at this museum. Now, I was translating for them, you know, Peter would say this and he'd say that, and I was translating back and forth. Then I walked away, and I came back, and they're talking, but they're not speaking the same language, but he's going, Peter, Peter. He's showing them all the little intricacies of this uh, printing press. He's going, Peter, you know, guarda, what, you know, like this, and Peter's going, yeah, they get it. They're two printers. They understand each other. So then we go back to Venice, and the press is going to arrive the next morning. So we get up at dawn and everything that comes to Venice has to be, come, it comes in by truck and then they unload it on this loading dock and then they have to put it on boats and barges mm -hmm. to deliver whatever, your groceries, your piano, anything. So there's our friend Franco Ferrari and he's, we worked with him, he's also a poet. Uh, he comes to pick us up and he's come, come on, come on, you know, it's dawn. You can see it's like early morning and because the printing press has arrived at the dock. So these guys are now gonna load it. They're loading. And they have a big, <laughs> er, you know, thing to load it onto the boat. They've loaded it on there. And now we're going down the Grand Canal with the presses in it, and we're going to take it to this Scuola Grafica where P Peter has his studio. So there we are with our little glam shots here. And this is a bunch of paparazzi because they were going to, these are German journalists who are taking, we're doing an article on this uh, making of a book in Venice. There we are. Glamour, Glamour shot on the boat. <laughs> and now they're going to unload it. And you see they've got this big crane, and it weighs, how much does this printing press? 3,000 pounds. 3, pounds. And Peter kept thinking they were going to drop it in the canal. I said, Peter, they've been doing this for thousands of years. <laughs> you see that the, the barge is actually tipping <laughs> with the weight of this thing. So now they're pushing it down the car. They're going to take it to the school. Right at this spot, this beautiful woman walked by, and, all, I, and I couldn't get my camera to work fast enough. They all went like this. <laughs> when she walked by. So there they are, pushing, pushing, pushing. It's on wheels, of course. Now they got it. they're at the squala. They're pushing it through the door. And there's Peter. <sighs> there's my press. So we didn't drop it in the drink. And that's the Scuola Internazionale. And we gotta, we've got to celebrate with martinis because they didn't drop the press in the, in the Grand Canal. <laughs> so there we are. Happy as clams. So the next morning, Peter's all dressed in his printer blocks, and he's got his little manuscript under his arm, and it, off he goes. He's going to walk, walk into his studio, beautiful place. And this is the view for a couple of months out the window to the Grand Canal, and it was just the most beautiful spot. And all day long, these boats are going by, and also gondolas. And he finally becomes friends with the gondoliers, and they come by the window, they go, hey, Peter, Peter. <laughs> Here comes our paper by FedEx. <laughs> it delivers. So now is the process. So you saw that little block of type. They now have to space it out. And, he, and Peter actually brought his spacing materials, which are little tiny pieces of copper and brass, brass to space out those letters. And this is a, a lot of famous printers in their own right, including Russell. This is a guy from Canada, Crispin Elsted came to help work on this book because they thought this was a, one of the most romantic and fantastic things to come and print a book in Venice, one of the cradles of printing and printing history. So he's there too. 
and there's Peter. So they're going, they're going over, they're checking the, um, the typescript, looking for the mistakes because the Italian ladies didn't speak English. And they're, so he's spacing it out. Now you can see, look at how that is, has expanded from this to this. And he's spacing, they use tweezers. He's pushing aside the, the letters to put in this spacing material. And this is a real, I don't want to say science for these guys, because it's very important how this, these letters get spaced out in the page. And this, you can't have hanging punctuation, which means if you had a sentence like this and there'd be a comma out there, it has to be, you know, they worked months on this. And these are the galleys. It shows you the different pages of the book. Well, now we got to eat, so I'm the, I'm mm -hmm. the cook, so I'm going to the market to, uh, to pick, a, you know, pick the food for dinner. And I just want to tell you that we're, it wasn't just all work. You know, we had, we had a drink by the canal. And there's Peter. They have to have dinner. Mmm, mm, these are all good. Spaghetti with lobster sauce. <laughs> so we were eating and drinking and having a good time and going to parties too. So back to work. So I'm a paper conservator, so I dampened the paper. The paper had to be dampened for the printing because of the paper accepts the ink better and impression better. So I had this system where I'm dampening the paper. So they're starting to print. And this is jo uh, Jonathan, uh, Peter's assistant. And uh, he came over too, so he's they're starting to print now. And that took a couple of weeks, a month. What's that? How long did the printing itself? Oh, yeah, well, it was a month. Off, right? Month. Peter checking again for mistakes, so they go over every letter after it's printed to see, you know, if they see a, you know, something that doesn't look right, they have replaced the letter and they, they reprint that page. There's Russell came over. Yes, Russell Young. They're young. On the, the last day, and that was the title page. Which That's is the title. A, a printer like us is that we save the title page for last. It's like the yeah. dessert. So there's the sti the stinker, printing away. <laughs> <laughs> having lunch. We got to have lunch. You know, we have lots of wine. <laughs> then we got to have a cigarette. <laughs> These two, those, the guys in the. Well, this guy and the other guy, they were two printers from Verona that heard about this book being printed in Venice. So they came over to see what's going on and to talk, you know, printing talk. And so there's uh, Peter printing away, looking, checking it. Cinderella cleaning the apartment. <laughs> but these drying racks, you see the clothes in the, in the, in the background, those are going to come in very handy because uh, we had to then dry the pages because they're damp. So we pack them up every day. We haul them back in a little shopping cart, you know. And then I, I went around this apartment building and the, and the people would put their, dry, their clothes drying racks outside their doors. People in, in Italy do not have dryers. It just uses too much electricity. So everybody dries their clothes on these racks. So I kind of went around and I put the paper all over these racks, all over the apartment and I put fans on and shuffled the papers till they were dry. And there's Peter looking at our beautiful uh, illustration. And as soon as they print the last page, they start to immediately, I mean, I'm not talking, like five minutes later, they're dissembling the type. They're taking it apart. Peter wants his coppers back. That lead, <laughs> that lead goes into that, what they call the hell box. They just take it all apart, they throw it in the box, and then it goes back to this, um, this mono-type company, and they'll melt it down and make something else. And we paid like, I don't know, $10,000 for this type. I go, ah, it's the hell box. So I thought, I can't believe this, all that work, and then immediately. So the last page is uh, uh, the um, colophon. It has everybody's name in it that worked on the book. And we're sort of right here in the middle and I said, I'm not throwing our names into the hell box. So this is a little pile of all our names, all the letters. And I threw it, took it out and threw it in the canal, which goes right out to the graveyard where Joseph Brodsky is buried because he, he passed away before this book was made. So I threw it. And I said, don't let, don't, I, hope it, I looked up and down to make sure no one was looking. 
<laughs> they throw a lot of stuff in those canals, believe me. <laughs> but lead is not a good thing. So <laughs> then, you know, we have to, uh, the real title of the book when it was first published was called The Fondazione degli Incurabili. Well, his Amer so Brodsky's American publisher, Ferrar Strauss and Giraud, thought that was too, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> So they came, you know, they came up with a, a, an English word, watermark. But I said, it's got to appear somewhere on this book, the real title. So the, the deluxe, there was five deluxe copies that we had ebony boxes made to kind of look like an idea of a gondola. And we had a bronze made of the real title. And this is Chris Steinauer that people have been talking about. And he, he's a stone cutter. He designed this a, 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 maquette to make this um, bronze. And so there's one foundry in Venice. They make all the door knockers and everything you ever see in Venice. And it's in this beautiful uh, place on the back of Venice. And here are these guys. They're, they're, they're going to cast our bronze, our five um, bronze plaques to go on the book. And look at, look at their, <laughs> this would never happen in America. I mean, look at their, <laughs> they've got on tennis shoes and shorts, and, you know, <laughs> and they're shoveling in this molten metal. And in there, there's signs on the walls that say, you know, no smoking, and the smoke is, <laughs> you know, there's no smoking allowed. And this is this cauldron of the metal. And this is sort of roughly what it comes out with. It's made in this sand from Fontainebleau, and every, every plaque is made and cast by hand. And then all these, these pieces get filed off, and then there has to be a patina put on it, and that's what it looks like. And that goes embedded into the, um, the cover of this uh, deluxe copy. So this is Fondamento degli Incurabili, and there's Peter's mark there's Perner's mark so then we think we better go out to the graveyard San Michele and visit the grave of Joseph Brodsky he would he would have loved this actually one time he said he was standing there looking at San Michele because he didn't really realize he'd be buried there and he said oh I'd like to be buried there and my and my gravestone would say here lies Joseph not so far from Padua <laughs> so <laughs> They hadn't gotten it together there at the, at the uh, cemetery. So you have Ezra Poundsbury there, uh, Diaglova, Stravinsky, and so they put Brodsky with a little, <laughs> little <laughs> magic marker. It was still, <laughs> stuff. it said, I don't know if they fixed this, but this was quite a while. This was about 15 years ago. So we go out and we, you know, we're looking at his grave and, and Joseph liked to, uh, Liked to have, he liked to drink, and he liked to smoke cigarettes. He smoked cigarettes a lot. <coughs> and there's these little buckets, and people leave notes and cigarettes and grappa and, you know, little. So we picked up a, a little note, and it says, Brodsky, you're a great poet, even in Chinese. <laughs> so we're back to the studio, and this is Bob Morgan. So he's the artist, so he's signing the colophon page. <coughs> And there's Peter, cleaned up his studio, packed up all his stuff, looking out the last time out his window, which was such a beautiful view. And then we're going to say goodbye to our friend Franco, have a couple of drinks, and uh, say goodbye to Venice in a wine glass. And you can see that actually in a, in a glass, it reflects, it reflects the scene upside down. It's really kind of cool. So off we go, back to the airport. Leaving Venice, we've mailed our stacks of paper. Everything's finished, and we're back to Berkeley. Oh, there was another slide, but it's not there. Okay, so back in Berkeley, uh, Jonathan is now binding the book, and that took a year. Three to five months. Yeah. Thirty copies. Back, and they were back in the studio. That was supposed to be the slide before. That's what studio looks like. And he's binding, and this is the title page, which is so beautiful, and says, you know, printed in Venice in 2016. 
you can see how the pages turn. And this is a, one of the pages with the illustrations. And there's the, the deluxe copy with the sort of the gondola-like box. That was another story, how they made these boxes. We only made five of them with the um, bronze plaque embedded into it. And this is the last page of type. We didn't send it back to the foundry because it was just so beautiful. We gave it to one of the booksellers there. And this just sort of sums it up the project. It sums up Joseph Brodsky. It's, it, it sums up Venice. And one, the last page, which we made, which was shaped, as they call it, and he says, Brodsky says, let me reiterate, water equals time. And, pro and provides beauty with its double. Part water, we serve beauty in the same fashion. By rubbing water, this city improves time's looks, beatifies the future. That's what the role of this city in the universe is, because the city is static while we are moving. The tear of pr is proof of that, because we go and beauty stays. Well, That's up. That's Bust us. So, so it's a beautiful book made in a city that's the symbol is a lion holding a book. <laughs> and that's Venice. <laughs> Photographs. Yes, I did. Thank you. It was kind of amateurish, but <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Well, any, any other questions about Venice or printing? Yes. We figured it was like a hundred thousand dollars. Without paying ourselves. Without yeah. Well, I mean, two years of work, but yes, for this particular cash book. So that's what. And so there's thirty-five. There were 30 mm -hmm. books, or 35 books for sale, and the deluxe ones go for more. So he did recoup, finally, um, the costs that were put into it, but it took a long time. I mean, there's still a couple left for sale, but it takes a long time. It could take 10 years to recoup the money you put into something like that. So and it was a lot of work, yeah. Are they printing more books in Venice? In Venice? This was the first book printed in Venice in 100 years. Like that. And well, who knows? There might be somebody making something there. But um, well, we have a, a, Germ a German friend that's, I don't know if he's printing anything he, there. But we, ha we were invited to a conference called Il Libro di Venezia, which is the history of printing in Venice. And they invited us because Peter was the last word, because he was the last book that was printed in Venice. And we're showing a, the slideshow like this, and there was full of Venetians in the audience, and they're looking at their own city, going, you know, they, lo they love it too. So, you know. so uh, yeah. But it was a, that's the, the, the strange thing is these places that were like the cradles of printing, like Venice and Italy, they've gone on to mechanized ways of printing, you know, uh, commercial printing, and so they got rid of all the printing presses, and that that printing museum, the guy also is a, has a commercial business, that guy that started it, and he went around Italy collecting all these old printing presses because he thought they were very beautiful, and the type. So it's, it's really ironic that there's nobody, well, there was a couple guys in Verona that were kind of making books like this, uh, but very few, very few. There's some in. Were the copies of the book in Venice? Yes, because we gave, uh, we gave one to the, um, the the Squala Graphic <coughs> because they hosted us, <coughs> and we gave one to the Tipoteca because they did so much. They helped us so much with this project. So actually, they've they've been loaned out many times because people wanted to put them in exhibits in Venice and and around Italy. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two, and then one Venetian said it was a moral obligation to buy this book. <laughs> he bought the book. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Everybody, you know, pr this is a printer's t tradition. Everybody that worked on the book with Peter, and there was about 10, I don't know, he gave one of the books to them. 
So Russell got one, and, and Crispin got one, and Jonathan got one. They all, so it's a kind of a tradition amongst printers to, to do this sort of thing. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this kind of ends our, our little show on dog and pony, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, I want to thank whoops, I want to thank Nicole for the work she spent months and months and months putting on this exhibit and curating it, and she did an incredible job and uh, worked very hard. So. How fun, everybody. This was just amazing. Thank you for those that came for the entire time, and some of you were able to slip in as the day went on. Um, thank you so much for starting it off, Aaron, and, and getting the ball rolling. And you had a lot, you speak very eloquently. I enjoyed it, yes. And then we moved on to Roberto. And that was a lovely interview, the way you guys sat and discussed together. Then we moved on to Russell, and that was more interesting <laughs> things. Thank you for that, and, and nice imagery as well. And then thank you so much, Susan, for your time today, too, and sharing a bit about the process and your, a bit of your life together. And then, of course, for Peter gracing this institution and your work. I, it's an eye-opener for me, and I would imagine potentially some other people in our audience. It's really new, new for me. And as an artist myself, I really appreciate learning more about the process and the time and the investment and the thought and the passion that goes into it. So thank you so much for being here. I hope all of you will stay for the art opening. Uh, we have some wine and some beautiful charcuterie boards out there in the gallery. And... I'm sure all of these people will be here to talk to you guys, talk to you with the work in front of you, you know, so you can learn a little bit more. Thank you all again so much. Again, Nicole, bravo, my dear. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Oh, and one more shout out. I, I don't know if Alma heard this earlier, but again, tomorrow there is a community workshop. It is a free workshop titled A Letter to Home. You can come make a large paper, piece of paper, an insert for an accordion book that we will put on display upstairs on the second floor or down in our education department. So, and this is in line with this exhibition. So, come on out from, ten, from 11 to 3 tomorrow. Thanks.